Southern York County along the New Hampshire border, uh, representing the towns of Kittery, Elliott, South Berwick, Half of Berwick, York, and Agunquit. And the co-chair of the committee, I'm gonna ask to introduce himself next, is Representative Barry. Good morning, nice to see you all, nice to be with you on this April 1st. Um, I, uh, I'd encourage you not to take any wooden nickels today. Um, and uh, my name is Seth Barry. I am state representative for Bowdoin, Bowdenham, uh, almost all of Richmond and the unorganized territory of Perkins Township, also known as Swan Island. Great, and we'll go around the virtual horseshoe. Uh, the next person is Representative Ziegler. Good morning, <clears throat> on April Fool's Day, I'm uh, Representative Paige Ziegler. I represent the seven towns in Waldo County of um, Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Montfo, Morrow, Palermo, and Sears Mott. And then Representative Kessler. Good morning, I'm Representative Chris Kessler, District 32, which is the middle portion of South Portland and a smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Representative Wood. Good morning, I'm Barb Wood, and I represent House District 38, which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Representative Foster. Good morning, I'm Steve Foster, representing District 104, which includes the towns of Dexter, Charleston, Exeter, Stetson, and Garland. Representative Cuddy. Good morning, my name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville. And I did pull over before introducing myself and then I'll get back to driving. Very good. And you can, uh, you can uh, stop your video if you want. Uh, Representative Grahowski. Good morning all, Nicole Grahowski. I represent House District 132, City of Ellsworth, Town of Trenton. And I apologize immensely that the, the April Fool's joke was that I couldn't find the Zoom link. <laughs> Uh, Representative Foster, uh, I'm sorry, Representative Wadsworth, your name says Stephen Foster for some reason. I am uh, I had to use his Zoom link because I too couldn't find the uh, Zoom link this morning. Something must have been done, done a little differently. No, I am Representative this, Nathan Wadsworth. This doesn't uh, mean that Representative Foster gets to vote twice. <laughs> I will be changing my name in just a second. Uh, I, uh, my border, uh, my district goes right up the New Hampshire border as well, just above our, our fearless chair. And uh, I represent the towns of Hiram Porter, Brailfield, Freiburg, and Lovell. Great. And for committee members and the public members, uh, notice we have two clerks on today. Um, Izzy Zox, who has been our clerk replacing Ben is going to be leaving us unfortunately, and we are going to have, fortunately, Jordan uh, come join us. So if you guys could un-video um, yourself or video yourself um, so we can see you both. Uh, for members of the public, these are the people you communicate directly with to communicate with our committee. Um, Izzy, uh, we stole from uh, Legislative Information Office and uh, to replace Ben and I had to um, pay off the LIO with a with a um, a basket of brownies from my wife, and then Izzy turned around and was stole by the Secretary of Senate's office. Um, so now we've got Jordan coming on to join us. So uh, any questions you have, procedural questions, uh, different things, how to get on, where's the link, where where's this information, how do I sign up, should be directed to Izzy and Jordan. We have two committee analysts. Um, our principal analyst, I would say, is Deirdre Snyder, um, who's on today. And our secondary analyst is Dan Tartikoff. They perhaps won't like me referring to them as primary and, and secondary, but Dan has been for years doing the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Deirdre comes back to us uh, on the Energy and uh, Utilities and Technology Committee. Um, and they will be swapping off, but for the most part, primarily uh, Deirdre will be our primary analyst. Um, Deirdre and Dan, are you there? Can you just show your faces if you will? There they are. I'm not sure if Dan is off doing something else. And it's a good point for me to tell the presenters and uh, members of the public watching, you'll often see people um, stopping their video, going to do other things or logging off or logging back on. 
in the main legislature, often members serve on multiple committees. Representative Wood serves on multiple committees. So she'll be going in and out to other committees. We also have bills we need to present in other committees and things going on in our personal lives like dogs chasing squirrels and things like that, that we have to deal with. So it's no reflection on your presentation or the people testifying. If we occasionally have to drop in or out, it's just a, um, a reflection of the fact when you have a citizen's legislature, uh, by citizen's legislature, I mean people who, who do this on a, on a uh, part-time basis, uh, continue to work and continue to manage the rest of their lives. We have many uh, things going on at once. Um, we have two presentations to do today uh, in the morning. And for those members who just joined us, we're gonna be taking a break after the presentation to allow for any caucuses that may be needed uh, before we go into our work sessions. And our first presentation will be from the PUC to go over its report um, regarding um, net energy billing. And then we've asked the people from Daymark uh, to come here and, and do uh, a report for us too as well. I'll ask the people to go through entirely their report before going on to questions um, so they can get through their report and then I'll allow as much time as we want uh, for questions on their report. Is there anything anyone from the committee needs before we start? Seeing nothing, I'll turn it over to um, uh, Chairman Bartlett for his presentation. Hi, good morning, Senator Lawrence. Uh, represent very members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Let me just share my screen here. And uh, Senator Lawrence, are you seeing the the just the slide? Are you seeing the slide with uh, a, a ne the next slide? I'm seeing just the slide, so I think you're on slide view. Perfect. Uh, I've got two different screens, and they're showing me different things. So I want to make sure. Well, good morning, everybody. Again, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, what I thought I would do before jumping into the specifics around energy billing is to start with a broader view uh, of how this fits in, I think, to a larger conversation of where we're going. Uh, and then from there, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the information from our, our NEB report. Uh, I'll comment a little bit based on some very preliminary observations of the Daymark uh, report, uh, and then leave you with some parting thoughts and be happy to take questions uh, after that. But, as you all know, uh, we have in Maine very aggressive uh, renewable energy and decarbonization targets that you've set. Uh, the goal is 80% of retail electricity sales by 2030 will be renewable, uh, going 100% renewable by 2050. And we have a, uh, a goal to be carbon neutral by 2045. These are appropriately aggressive uh, goals reflecting where we are with climate change and the need to um, get ready for uh, a very significant uh, transition to cleaner fuels. In order to meet these clean energy and carbon reduction goals though, uh, will require significant investment. And I just want to identify a few of the big ones, some of the big ones um, that we will see. Obviously we need to bring on a lot of grid scale renewables uh, as well as storage in order to uh, meet the uh, requirements for renewables and to get us through the times when uh, renewables are not uh, actually generating electricity through storage. Uh, on the distribution grid, we need to bring on more distributed energy resources, which is obviously the topic today, uh, and also include uh, storage in the distribution network as well. We will have to, uh, in order to move people, uh, their heating and transportation sectors to electricity, uh, is likely to require pretty significant um, incentives over time. And those could be paid either on your electric bill or, or through some other uh, source of funding. Uh, as you, uh, I think, are aware, we have opened a proceeding looking at how to modernize the distribution grid. And that's really focused on two big things. One, understanding sort of the engineering and technological requirements that are going to be needed, but also taking a hard look at 
what kind of data needs to be gathered and shared so that we can take the maximum advantage of of the distribution system to achieve our goals. For example, making sure that we can uh, have good demand response by having good information, that we can put DERs where they're gonna add the most value, um, where so we can assess um, non-wires alternatives, I think in a more comprehensive way by having good information up front. Um, so that will also be part of that inquiry. Uh, and then on the transmission side, uh, is we're going to, uh, need significant upgrades either to bring on uh, renewables, for example, to bring on renewables in northern Maine or to connect offshore resources to the grid. Uh, and also there will be opportunities to strengthen interconnections with neighboring regions so that we can use that as a form of storage. When we have uh, a lot of abundant renewable energy generation that we don't need, other uh, regions could use it. And then similarly, when we are uh, struggling or we need more renewables, we can bring those in from the outside. Uh, on the transmission side of things, we are working with our partners in New England and with ISO New England uh, to do a future grid study that's looking at the reliability issues uh, as we move to integrating more and more renewables. And then secondly, the states have called on ISO New England to lengthen their planning horizon from a 10-year horizon uh, to a 30-year horizon so that we can incorporate uh, the various policy goals, get a better understanding of what's gonna be needed to integrate these resources so we're making investments uh, today for liability if we know that there, uh, we're going to be needing to bring out resources in a particular spot, uh, we can maybe be able to take advantage of uh, doing some of those investments together to save money. I think in a year we'll have a lot better insight both on the distribution side and transmission side of the scope of the costs, um, the magnitude of the costs that we're going to have to bear. Uh, a few considerations I think as you um, are approaching this sort of suite of potential investments. Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to decide how much ratepayers can or should be absorbing in costs at any particular time. Uh, we can't do everything at once. There's gonna to have to be some uh, prioritization. Uh, and then secondly, how do we use those limited ratepayer dollars um, to allocate amongst the various buckets uh, of opportunity? And uh, increasingly, uh, we're gonna to have to do some work around how to maintain cost causation principles. And in, in rainmaking, when we talk about cost causation principles, the idea is that when somebody comes onto the system, is using the system and enforcing costs to be incurred, that those costs are attributed to them um, rather than to everybody else. That gets turned on its head a little bit when you're either talking about a subsidy through rates um, or uh, in some cases, um, uh, as you start thinking about the very serious equity considerations as we are piling more and more costs on the electric bill. So I think those will be uh, increasingly uh, brought into focus in the years ahead. Many of the costs of the clean energy transition will of course be borne by electric ratepayers. Uh, certainly a lot of the distribution and transmission investments. Uh, and uh, as you know, we are currently procuring a lot of renewable resources um, that will be uh, paid at least in part by electric ratepayers. The challenge here is that oil and gas company customers are not paying any of the costs. So we are trying to move people um, from gasoline for their cars and oil for their furnaces, but when they go and make those purchases, they're not incurring any of the additional costs of the transition. That's all being done on uh, the electric side. And so we have to be mindful that uh, that will, as we make these investments and increase electricity rates, that that is going to change the equation. It's going to make it more costly for people to switch their heating and transportation to the electric system. That may require additional uh, incentives. And one of the things that I worry about is that there's a potential just this ratcheting up, needing more incentives, bring more people on, that further drives down the costs of oil and gas because demand is, is lower and they have to ever higher incentives. So I think it's really important that we be thoughtful about how we do this uh, to make sure that we are um, being as efficient as possible in helping to move people onto uh, electricity for, their, for more of their energy needs. Uh, because of the potentially enormous cost impact of all of these investments, uh, I think it's incredibly important that we assess each one to figure out how to get the maximum value for the lowest cost uh, for ratepayers. And I've listed here a number of considerations that I think are worth considering uh, as particular uh, investments and programs come before you. I think you've already seen uh, over the last few years, 
um, a lot being put on your plate in terms of requests uh, to support uh, various components of this. And that's only gonna grow in the years ahead. I think it's important to ask, uh, first and foremost, what needs to be done most quickly? What are the priorities? There are certain things that need to be done in order to enable additional investments down the road. Um, and there are some that uh, have a longer time horizon. So we need to think strategically about how we put together um, the, the timeline of investment. Secondly, are there opportunities to leverage non-ratepayer resources? Are there potentially federal dollars that might help with some of these investments? Um, are there uh, an opportunity to bring in private developers or other sources of funds to help share in these costs? I always ask, you know, whether costs of a particular proposal are likely to increase or decrease over time. For example, you might have a new technology with a pretty high price tag today that's expected to decrease uh, over time. And it may make sense to have some investment right away in order to help create the market um, for that technology. Uh, but you might want to spread that out over time if you expect cost to ultimately come down. And similarly, if you're looking at a particular investment um, that may be capitally capital intensive, uh, in interest rates are low, there may be an opportunity to do more of that in a low interest rate environment uh, than way down the road for cost to increase. Um, again, over what time frame will support be needed? There are some things that will need a one-time investment, and there are things that are going to need uh, an investment year after year in order to achieve. Uh, is the lowest, you know, is the, the proposal you're looking at the lowest cost for achieving specific goals? I think this is important both for new programs that are being developed, but also to evaluate existing programs to make sure we are, we are absolutely getting the best bang for the buck. Um, and then finally, when it comes down to economic benefits, um, this is, I think, sure, with a lot of the work that, that the legislature does around economic development, uh, but really assessing whether the benefits, how the benefits from investment get balanced against the rate impacts, the cost to uh, existing customers. Turning now to the NEB programs, um, I'm not gonna go through and regurgitate my entire report. I will highlight certain pieces of it and I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards as well. Uh, for the NEB programs um, that you've authorized, there are two different programs. Uh, the first is the kilowatt hour program. Uh, and this is where a customer is getting a bill credit that reduces both the supply charges on their bill for that amount of electricity and also the associated delivery charges. Much of a, in May, much of our delivery charges are, are paid on a kilowatt hour basis. So by removing the supply, you also remove that delivery charge. The challenge to that is those delivery charges don't just go away. Um, they will ultimately have to get absorbed somehow uh, by other customers uh, through higher rates. If, uh, if the utility such as CMP is on a decoupling uh, mechanism, uh, then that will happen automatically each year. Uh, otherwise, it's likely to happen in rate cases as there's a sort of a reapportionment of the revenue requirement uh, based on uh, load. And uh, this can be, this cost shift can be avoided, but to do it would require some significant rate design changes. One option of course is to increase the fixed charge uh, on the bill, so less of it is fluctuating at a kilowatt hour basis. Um, that would certainly reduce the cost shift, but it also would reduce the benefits uh, of these, uh, of the distributed resources, because you would be getting that credit on your bill. Uh, on the uh, second program is the CNI tariff program. Um, and this is where there's actually a payment, it is a bill credit uh, that's prescribed by statute. Currently, that ranges from 11.9 to 14.3 cents, depending on the particular utility and the customer class um, that is involved. And this is likely to increase over time because of the way it's calculated. Uh, to provide this slide, just to give you a sense of the breakdown between the kilowatt hour credit program and the tariff rate program uh, in both CMP and Verson territory. Uh, as you'll see, approximately 60% of the projects are in the CNI tariff rate program, and the balance are in the kilowatt hour credit program. There are significant benefits to distributed resources, uh, which is why um, you know, certainly I and a lot of other folks have been supporting uh, these over the years. Uh, first, there are significant societal benefits. There are the environmental benefits you get, including emissions reductions uh, from displaced fossil fuels. 
And there are also significant economic developments to the extent we're building uh, any kind of generation here in the state. Uh, I would point out that these benefits uh, apply both to DERs and also to large scale renewable development. Uh, a second category is avoided costs. Uh, DERs can significantly reduce the need for costly upgrades or other invest investments in the TND system, uh, but location is going to matter a lot here. Uh, if you think of uh, if you think of a place where there's a lot of anticipated load growth, um, putting in DERs very close to that could reduce the need for a lot of upgrades to the distribution network to serve that load. If the DER is 100 miles away, it has to go through substations and work its way down through the distribution system. The avoided cost of that will be a lot less um, because they, uh, you're still going to have to strengthen the distribution system where that load growth is happening uh, in order to get the electricity delivered, just as you would um, if there were a larger supply. So the avoided costs matter a lot, um, and, it, and, and it's important to really look at the location and ideally target DERs to the place where they're adding the most value. And a third big sort of bucket of benefits uh, is a reduction in supply prices. And this again would uh, applies to most uh, renewables when you're adding uh, significant supply that's creating downward pressure on the regional energy and capacity prices, which is a good thing uh, since natural gas is usually the driving the price of electricity in New England. At the, uh, public, he at the public hearing on uh, the NEB bills before you, I was asked uh, to write a few comments if I could about the Daymark study. I wanna initially just say as a caveat, I've reviewed the report. Um, I have not um, had any follow-up conversations at this point with Daymark. I look forward to hearing a lot more today uh, about the details of the report and learn about uh, probably a little more detail about some of the methodology. So these are very preliminary observations based on uh, you know, uh, reviewing the, the document as a whole. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, most of the benefits that are identified in the wholesale market, environmental and economic benefits would also be achieved from our grid scale procurements of solar energy and other renewables. And the, we know from our 3210G procurement, we just finished, uh, we completed the first round and are now in our second round. But in the first round, we saw uh, prices in the three to four cents per kilowatt hour basis. So for those sort of environmental, economic and supply price benefits, um, in the wholesale market, we can achieve a lot of those um, through the procurement, the large scale grid scale procurements as well. Uh, the environmental and economic benefits that are identified are certainly significant and very important to the state of Maine. They will not, however, reduce customer bills. So when we at the commission are talking about rate impact, we're talking about the, the bill, the electricity bill that folks are paying. And um, these other benefits though important uh, won't appear as an offset. And I think this becomes important in the context of thinking about beneficial electrification and the need to balance um, the need for investments on the electric side and the need to uh, make sure that we aren't uh, unduly skewing the incentives to switch to electricity for heating and transportation. Uh, Daymark does make a good point about avoided transmission charges. Uh, they're absolutely correct that the kilowatt hour program uh, will reduce the NR, what's called the RNS peak for the region, uh, meaning that uh, there'll be some relative savings in our transmission costs. Um, while you're not likely to see sort of a year-over-year -year reduction in transmission, uh, it would blunt the increase. And this is particularly important, I think, since uh, other states in the region are also have bring out a lot of DERs and seeing these kinds of load reductions there as well. Uh, another point um, in the report, it talks about the avoided RPS compliance costs. Um, and this is the idea that, um, they'll, that to the extent the DERs are supplied, it's just providing supply uh, directly to customers, um, there's no need for any additional RPS compliance. Um, this results largely from the current practice of how in Maine we determine compliance with the RPS and we use builds rather than metered supply. Uh, there's pending uh, at the commission a proceeding looking at whether to change this approach, whether um, to continue the practice of uh, doing compliance based on billing versus metering. And I think this, my understanding of this avoid RPS cost is 
is that it would it would be significantly reduced if we went to a metered supply approach. I'd also point out that if the recs from these units are sold uh, into the market, then the net effect would actually be a reduction in the RPS compliance. Because if I'm a customer and I, uh, and I have uh, subscribed to a solar project and I'm getting that supply, I'm not, uh, I have no RPS obligation on that supply. If, however, the RECs from that project are sold into the market, what I thought was renewable energy is essentially being swapped out for fossil fuel generation. So it is important to understand that to meet the long-term renewable goals, um, you're actually going to be undermining the RPS if the RECs beyond sort of the RPS compliance amount are sold. Uh, this has been an issue that we've seen um, in with some uh, large uh, uh, industrial consumers where they have a biomass plant sort of behind the meter. And we have required that they, if they want to sell the RECs from that biomass unit into the market, they can do so, but they must hold back a certain number to satisfy their RPS requirement. We don't allow uh, them to use it as a loophole to avoid RPS compliance. Uh, the next uh, item I just wanted to talk about briefly were the avoided standard offer costs that were identified in the Daymark, Daymark study. Again, these apply uh, just to the kilowatt hour credit program by reducing the load asset that the standard offer supplier has to serve. And this will reduce um, various costs in the whole, whole sale market for the standard offer supplier. We would, however, caution that at least in early years, to the extent there's uncertainty around the timing and amount of the kilowatt hour credits, um, this may increase the perceived risk to the standard offer provider because at the end of the day, they have to make sure that load is served, whether the DER units are performing as expected or not. And so there may be an offsetting increase uh, to adjust for that risk. Over time, um, if there is consistent performance, I think year in and year out from the DERs, um, and the estimate becomes quite reliable of what the output is, then I think you would start to see more of this reduction. But uh, I just raise this as a caution. We won't know until we uh, get a year or two in and see how uh, the standard offer bidding goes. On the CNI tariff rate program, uh, capacity savings were identified, um, which I think is appropriate. Uh, in the fall, FERC issued an order, uh, affectionately referred to as two by four, uh, that will enable the aggregation of DERs um, to be uh, to enter the wholesale markets. Uh, this is, I think, is an important step to make sure we can maximize the value out of our distributor resources uh, in New England and folks around the country. Uh, the rules for participation are still being ironed out uh, and are likely to take much of this year um, to sort through. And uh, once we know those rules, we'll have a much better sense of um, how, we will, how we can go about um, aggregating the capacity and, and getting payments for it. It is worth noting that capacity payments come with a corresponding obligation to deliver that capacity. Um, so to the extent we're, we're selling capacity in the market, there is some risk that if there's any failure uh, to deliver, that there'll be penalties um, that would go to ratepayers. So once we have all the rules in place around the aggregation of, of DER capacity, um, we will be in a better position to work with uh, utilities and others to analyze uh, what are the risks and, and benefits and to assess how much of this capacity uh, we can sell into the market. Uh, just a final note here, Daymark uh, concluded that the high tariff rate program the benefits and just again, highlighting that about 60% of the NAV projects um, that are in the queue are expected to fall in this category. Um, I look forward to hearing Daymark's presentation. These are obviously some very preliminary thoughts and. Um, I know they will uh, delve into a lot more detail and, and look forward to that conversation. Um, I just wanted to add a few points before I get to taking questions about um, the NEB legislation before you. Uh, you have a number of bills uh, seeking to make changes to the program. And I wanted to offer a few thoughts um, that you might consider as you're working through this legislation. First, I would urge you to establish a policy target for installed capacity. How much, are you, how much DER penetration are you trying to achieve? Um, 
I've provided here a couple of sources that you might look to. Uh, the GEO's uh, RPS study that was recently completed, I believe they were assuming uh, 500 megawatts by 2025 and then going up from there. And the Daymark scenarios range from 227 megawatts in 2021 uh, up to, I think, 1,029 megawatts uh, by 2030. So that gives you a sense of um, a range to, to begin thinking about what your target should be. I've also um, provided here a chart that I provided in earlier testimony, which just breaks down the current projects in the queue uh, based on sort of their current status, those that are in operation, those with NEB agreements, uh, those with applications, and then, then others in the queue. And it's about 2,600 megawatts at this point. A second important question uh, with respect to the current program is how much rate impact are you comfortable allocating? And I make this point with respect to the existing program because I think the, the first step is to figure out how much installed capacity do you want by then? And then the second part of the question is how much of it do we wanna fund through the program <laughs> as it exists today? And how much do we want to uh, set aside for a future program, a sort of phase two approach? To guide you in the thinking, I began to include a table that we approved our, provided our testimony trying to provide some estimate of what we think the cost impact could be based on the targets you choose. And this is based on the existing program. So obviously if changes get made um, going forward, uh, those costs will be adjusted as well. And finally, you know, I, I want, at the public hearing, I was struck by, there, was, there seemed to be a lot of pressure uh, that it would be unfair to make any changes um, to the program uh, for anyone who's sort of gotten a line, who's sort of gotten into the queue. And I want to stress that, that, which I think is probably obvious to most of you, but that you have the flexibility here to make a principal policy decision on where to draw the line around the existing program and then decide how you wanna transition into a phase two DR policy or program. Um, the way I sort of think about this is that uh, all development carries a certain amount of risk when folks uh, begin to line up projects and consider uh, moving them forward. There's no question in my mind that once a project has gotten to the point where they know what the costs of interconnection are and agree to pay them, when they have all their permits, they have their financing, they have their subscribers, um, and they make the decision to go and write the check to the utility for those significant upgrades, uh, and they begin construction, that at that point, it would be fundamentally unfair to change the program um, that got them to that point. But there's a lot of room between there and when someone first enters the queue. Um, and I think you heard um, at the public hearing that in fact, there is a fair amount of speculation around how many of these projects will actually get built. Um, several folks uh, suggested that 50% or more would not get built. And I think in the Daymark study, they say that the attrition right here could be anywhere from 25 to 75% based on the conversations that they had. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of room between first entering the queue and, and ending. And I think if you decide on a place where you wanna land in terms of install capacity, another approach we can take is to look at specific milestones along the way to make sure that those who have invested the most and are furthest along and most ready to go are the ones that get brought online first under the existing program uh, to protect as much of those investments that have been made as possible. So with that, I thank you for your time. I will go off screen share here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, uh, Chairman Bartlett. I'm just seeing a plethora of hands go up. Okay. And the word for today is plethora. So I'll go to, while we're waiting for the screen share to end, I'll go to Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, Chairman Bartlett. Um, I was wondering, uh, I apologize, but I was not able to fully hear the part on uh, when you mentioned oil and gas and their contribution to the process. Would you be able to repeat that section uh, yeah, I got, my basic point is that a, a lot of the costs of this energy transmission uh, transition, whether it's distribution costs, transmission costs, um, uh, a lot of the re renewable procurements and so forth, uh, will be borne by electric ratepayers. They're going on our electric bills. 
Um, and as a result, uh, oil and gas customers, right, are not paying that. So if I am charging my EV um, that I will someday have, um, I would be paying for this cost. If, however, I am filling up my car with gasoline, I'm not. Um, and in fact, I'm likely to see uh, stable or falling uh, fossil fuel prices as more and more people shift away from using gas and oil um, for their transportation and heating needs. So I think it's, it's just an important point that uh, we're not funding this across all fuel types. Uh, we're, to the extent we're putting costs on the electric ratepayer, that will distort the trade-off between electricity and other forms of fuel. And it's just important to take that into account because the more those costs increase, the more incentives that are gonna be required to get people to, to transition to electricity, which in turn will drive um, costs up further. So that's why I think it's really important to develop a strategic approach here, to think over the long term, what do we need to do in five, 10, 15, 20 years, and then make uh, a comprehensive decision about how we want to allocate the resources uh, to fund which portion of the transition when, and also I think aggressively be looking for opportunities for sources outside of electric rates that might support this effort. Great. Um, we'll go on to uh, Senator Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Barlett, for your presentation this morning. I thought it was particularly uh, insightful and helpful as we parse through a number of these issues uh, this session. Um, my question is more, I guess, from a high level in terms of um, the impact of and the relationship uh, between these some of these developers, um, and particularly with regard to the smaller projects. Um, you know, it seems to be that the legislature has created a, a system whereby these relationships are incredibly skewed towards benefiting the uh, developers as opposed to benefiting the ratepayers with regard to these smaller scale projects. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if examples of that abound, but, you know, particularly the fact that the smaller scales can basically walk away from these developments at any time. Um, the ratepayers are going to bear the cost of that. Uh, and they're, they're subsidized at a significantly higher amount than some of the grid scale projects. So can you talk a little bit about the role of, you know, the PUC as you see it, um, as you try to mitigate the harm to the ratepayers to the greatest extent? Um, because that, to me, that's, that's a significant problem that we're going to have to figure out one way or the other. I think one of the challenges here is that we don't have a lot of visibility into the projects or the details around them, right? Um, so we know about how some of them are, are pitching to customers because we get the mail just like everybody else, or we see the advertisements like everybody else. But you know what we're seeing is we see sort of what's in the queue and whether it's designated for the CNI program or kilowatt hour program. Um, but there, there's not a direct regulatory function over these um, particular resources. So I think the relationships vary. I think there are uh, some that are, uh, that are developed with institutions or commercial customers uh, that look very different from some of the other projects that are, are pitched more, more broadly to um, residential customers. Um, but I, I hesitate to say too much because I, we just don't have um, tremendous visibility into, into the, the details of the project and, and how they're financed and how they're um, supporting the, the subscribers of those projects. Follow up, uh, yeah. Senator Stewart. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in your opinion, as the chair of the PUC, do you feel like that is a um, logical and uh, 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 reasonable place for the role of, of your organization to be playing that role as these projects come in and, and having more oversight over uh, where those projects are, how they're gonna impact ratepayers, what the future of these, these projects are gonna look like? I think in general, I mean, these are private um, developers. This is a competitive, uh, theoretically competitive process. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that we would, we would be 
it would be appropriate for us to necessarily be regulating the way we would uh, utilities and so forth. Um, I do think that if you're thinking about how much to how much of an incentive to provide to these projects, that I think looking at the locational value makes a lot of sense. Um, I think one of the things that we are hoping will come out of our grid modernization process is uh, an opportunity to create more visibility into the grid so that developers and others can see where uh, resources will add the most benefit. And then ideally you would coordinate the amount of the ratepayer support based on the size of that benefit. Like how big are the avoided costs in one location versus another? New York has adopted what's called the value stack approach, which looks at the locational value of these resources. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to, to, to pay the same high rate to somebody who's going in near a load center that might be uh, helping to significantly lower costs as you are to putting um, a facility 100 miles away where it, it, there will be some beneficial impact to the grid, but not nearly the same um, as the one that is very close to the load center. So I think we need a better understanding of the location of values uh, and how to target investment where it's going to do the most good. Any follow-up, Senator Stewart? No, that's, that's it for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Bartlett, for uh, your presentation this morning and for taking these questions. Uh, I greatly appreciate uh, some of what you said early in your presentation on uh, some of the added costs to, uh, to rate payers that uh, have come about from some of our uh, actions uh, in the legislature. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, I, I greatly appreciate the PUC being somewhat of a steadying hand in all of this. Uh, and I'm looking back to uh, early in the 129th when we uh, made the decision to do away with gross metering, which was a method that the PUC developed to uh, try to help uh, lessen the, uh, the shift to uh, rate payers from, from uh, solar installations. Uh, at that time, I, as I recall, that was basically considered to be about a $109 million shift. I may have that wrong. Well, my question would be, and obviously uh, I don't expect you have the information now, but maybe Garrett or someone could get it to us later. With the, program, the, the uh, installations that have come about since then, where we are present day, uh, do we have a, uh, can we get an estimate or, a, or an actual number for what that uh, cost is in, in, in now that uh, more installations in place? Uh, now gross metering was, was not a, uh, uh, maybe the right best way to take care of that. And I think you've mentioned some other methods that might, we might consider, but uh, I'm just curious as to uh, if, if we can, do you have a number that uh, that is now costing rate payers uh, for those uh, shifts in, in transmission and other costs. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm sure we can get that for you. And I, I do think the cost table that I provide there would give you a sense. We have about 100 megawatts of uh, distributed generation currently built. But we can, we can um, I'll check with my team to see if we refine that for you. Representative Wadsworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Nice to see you this morning, Mr. Bartlett. Um, let's see. I was wondering, is it possible for a small solar to help Maine satisfy its RPS if the RECs don't come along with the payment uh, for, for kilowatts? Yeah, I think you're going to be, uh, what you'll be doing is undermining it, right? So if, if you're, you essentially would be using the REC twice. So if, if I get, if, if I don't have to, if I take the solar output and I don't uh, have a standard, I don't have an RPS obligation, and then those RECs are sold, then absolutely, then they're, it's as if I'm not using renewable energy at all. So it's, it's going to weaken the impact. So, and I'm not suggesting, I don't know, I, I'm not suggesting that that's happening. I'm just suggesting that is a, a potential risk. And I think something that as we go forward are gonna wanna look at or may have to look at. 
Representative Wadsworth, did you want to follow up? All set. Okay. Other questions for Chairman Bartlett? Uh, Representative Grohowski. Uh, my question is actually for you, Mr. Chair. Will we be able to ask questions of the PUC after the Daymark presentation as well? Because I think that will help me put together both topics in the same, <laughs> in, my, in my one brain. If, if Chairman Bartlett is willing to hang around and I see him shaking his head, he is, that I'll have questions both to Daymark and to the PUC after Daymark presentation. Okay, thank you. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chair Bartlett, uh, for your presentation this morning. Um, you've touched a couple of times on locational value of distributed resources. And I just wanted to maybe ask for a quick update about the non-wires alternatives process, which this committee initiated, uh, uh, so I guess that was um, in 2017, I think it was, um, that we passed the bill to move that process forward. Um, and just as a reminder for those who were not on the committee at the time, um, a non-wires alternative was first really done in Maine as a pilot program. Um, Dr. Richard Silkman and, and Grid Solar um, uh, decided to request uh, the opportunity to do a demonstration project on the Booth Bay Peninsula, which um, as an alternative to an $18 million uh, build out of transmission uh, by the utility um, they said they could do it with solar and storage um, and some other technologies. And um, I believe the experience then was instead of an $18 million projected cost, it was a $6 million actual cost. So, you know, it seemed that that um, had a lot of opportunity to um, take advantage of locational um, benefits of DG. And that may give us uh, a little bit of light as to how we go forward. So I just wanted to give the opportunity, um, Chair Barlett, to you know, touch on that and where the commission's at with that as we think about sort of net energy billing 2.0. So there are a couple of projects that I know are, are sort of working their way through the process. Uh, it doesn't come to us unless there's sort of, sort of a dispute. So this initial matter, um, the non-wires alternative coordinator is sort of trying to work it out with the utilities. Um, and then if there is a dispute that would come to us. So that may be happening um, in the near future, but it hasn't yet. I do think that information is key and, and having some conversations with, with folks who are involved in this process is clear to me that there just is not good information uh, in terms of insight into the grid, which makes it harder to assess where these NWAs make sense. And I'm not saying that I fault the utilities for that necessarily. They're not, they're not gathering the information because they haven't needed it. They are not in the generation um, business, right? They're in a, a wires business. So, but the, the world is changing and the grid needs to um, be made to serve uh, customers for the next 30 years. And so we need to identify both what specific pieces of information are gonna be most helpful uh, to assess non-wires alternatives and um, how do we make sure that that is um, kept up to date uh, and is available to the developers who might be able to take advantage of it, the non-wires alternative coordinator, and certainly to us at the commission. Are you all set, yes. Representative Barry? Thank you, yes. Uh, Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair Bartlett, for being here today and going over this with us. Um, I appreciate your analysis. I tend to come to these issues from a higher level. Uh, I'm not as immersed in many of the details as some of my colleagues here on the committee. My concern, having listened to your summary of the report and what you've been talking about also in terms of the Daymark study is I want to make sure that the benefits of a beneficial electrical grid are fully accounted for, that the benefits of renewable energy are fully accounted for. Particularly, I think it's going to be important in the study of how to modernize the grid because it, it seems to me that, that companies that are putting projects on the ground are contributing to the value of the grid. They're contributing to the benefits that we all can at some point um, experience. It may have a, a momentary imbalance in the cost side of things, but that's precisely why I wanna make sure that as a policymaker, we're really looking at the full picture around what the benefits are because 
I think we're all in agreement that renewable energy is the way to go. Uh, whatever happens to the price or the availability of gas and oil, you know, we're moving the ship in a certain direction um, for lots of reasons. And so I wanna make sure that we fully account for um, the benefit. So I, I, the question hidden in all of this, <laughs> Chairman Bartlett, is if you could say a little bit more of how you're going to be looking at the benefit side of the equation, uh, particularly in the modernization study that you've mentioned. So, I mean, I absolutely agree with you that the benefits of renewables are significant and need to be factored into decision making and largely your policy making um, as you're making decisions. I think my, my a couple of points I would just uh, to highlight around that um, is uh, some of the benefits of renewables you get from large scale as well as small scale renewable. So if your primary focus is on environmental and economic development, uh, you can get that pretty affordably uh, at very little cost to ratepayers uh, through grid scale renewable generation. There are added benefits you get from DERs. And so the, 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 a key policy question is how much of uh, that, how much focus do you wanna put or how much uh, DER penetration do you think is important to achieving these long-term goals as opposed to um, should the, ben the benefits for renewables? Because if you can get this, if you can get the benefits, most of the benefits for three to four cents, the question is, what do you get for added value from the distributor resources and how much of that do you need on the system um, to really to find an, an efficient uh, balance? I think in terms of the uh, grid modernization study, I think that's gonna give us a better sense of the kinds of uh, improvements that are going to be need to be made to the grid to maximize the benefits of the distributed resources and including uh, implementation of more storage on the distributed system. Uh, and then also will help us to assess how do we get the information that developers uh, and the NWA coordinators and others need in order to make good decisions about how to uh, install these resources in a way that gets the maximum benefit for the minimum cost. So my overarching theme here, I think, is really make, really think through um, what benefits you're trying to achieve sort of in each category, uh, and then how do you minimize the cost so that ratepayers are not spending any more than necessary? Uh, because yes, there'll be, there's, no matter what you do, there's going to be some distortion in the trade-off between fossil fuels and electricity here. Uh, but I think we have an opportunity and an obligation to ratepayers to try to minimize that as much as possible. Are you all set, uh, Senator Vitelli? Okay, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, thank you, Commissioner Bartlett. Uh, in, in looking at uh, the fact that this ship has sailed uh, uh, and considering what I now know about our uh, climate change and uh, uh, plan here to uh, thwart that, uh, I think you would agree that details are very important. Uh, and, and I'm wondering uh, how much if uh, how much the PUC has now in place that allows you to look at uh, proposed projects as far as uh, accepting those or turning them down in regards to location, uh, in, in regards to what uh, it's going to cost for grid uh, improvements, uh, depending on that location and size, and in regards to what uh, the cost will be to the ratepayers. Obviously, all of this is going to cost more. I think from your presentation today, although we've discussed this many times in the past, you were again pointing out that there are less expensive ways to get to that same final uh, goal uh, than some of what we've chosen or allowed to happen in the state of Maine thus far. And uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, are there things that we can do, for instance, to, to to change legislation or change rule that's not there maybe now that would allow the PUC to uh, better help us in uh, reaching those goals in a more efficient and less expensive manner? And if so, do you have any thoughts on where we might go with that in legislation? Thank you. I think there are a few things here. One, you could um, certainly direct us uh, to help develop a program 
uh, with locational incentives. So that the next phase of, of DER policy uh, really does take a look at that because currently we don't have the authority to say yes or no to a project based on location. Um, so I think that's part of it. Uh, secondly, you can use a procurement process. Um, as I think you know, uh, 1711 had a GG procurement that we ultimately ruled was not competitive. Um, it did not accept any bids. Um, that's a place where we had flexibility and we used it. Um, if nothing is done, we will be going back to a procurement using that same model uh, later this year, May or June of this year. So you may consider, one thing you might consider is modifying um, that procurement, either getting rid of it and, and using just the other NEB support mechanisms or um, shifting a little bit away from, say, the, the tariff rate program to more of a procurement model where we would uh, be factoring in some of those locational uh, incentives and otherwise. So I think there's a lot of room here to craft a policy that will both support DER uh, development and do it in a way that will um, maximize um, the benefits. A third thing is, you know, the, is providing some to think differently about how we are sort of subsidizing these. You know, we have the PUC has absolutely no discretion over the CNI tariff rate that, that's used. Um, so there's no opportunity to try to get that closer to the actual costs of development. So, you know, when I think about minimizing costs, you know, part of that is thinking about how do we pay just enough to incentivize the development we want but make sure we're not spending a penny more. Um, because to me, that's just good policy and helps to stretch ratepayer dollars as far as possible. Representative Foster, yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, chance to follow up on that. Uh, and Chair Bartlett, if also the PUC could provide for us information on 1711, uh, the, I believe it's part A, if you will, of that, where we, uh, procured uh, grid scale uh, investment, uh, at which I believe has come in at three and a half, four cents kilowatt hour. If you could uh, give us the numbers that would compare what that, in, again, today, uh, what that would be compared to for what was available on the grid versus that power and also how that, what the difference in cost uh, would be related to uh, part B of 1711, which is the, uh, the net metering portion. If, if we could just get those numbers to kind of clarify. <laughs> that yeah, I'll check my team. We'll get you um, some additional numbers and we may follow up um, for a little clarification on that, but I'm happy to help. Other questions for uh, the PUC before we hear the Daymark report? Seeing none, thank you very much, Chairman Bartlett. You will hang out uh, here, obviously. Um, uh, we appreciate that. And we'll go on to uh, the Daymark report. But before I do that, I'm going to ask um, those members who were not present when we did the introduction to introduce themselves. And I'll go to Senator Vitelli. Good morning. I am Senator Eloise Vitelli. I represent Senate District 23, which is all of Saginaw County and the town of Dresden in Lincoln County, and I reside in Arousic. And then Representative Grohowski. I already went. April oh, Fool's on you. <laughs> well, we kind of want to hear who you are twice. Uh, I was just kidding. Representative <laughs> Ziegler. Uh, oh, uh are we doing a repeat again, April? Did you, did you introduce yourself before? I know I'm so inclined. You know, as a first year EUT <laughs> member, I realized you just don't see me. But yes, <laughs> I did. I apologize, Representative Ziegler. I was kind of going across the screen and I was seeing who was after Representative Vitelli and I made the assumption that you guys Ziegler. came in after Representative Vitelli. So that's fine. Um, has everybody had a chance to introduce themselves? Representative uh, Senator Stewart, see, this is what happens when you begin to recognize one person. Senator Stewart, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in District 251 communities in Southern Arusik and Northern Penobscot counties, including the town of Monticello or Monticello, 
depending on how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> Good. Great. Okay. And uh, we're now going to have a presentation for Daymark. And I'll just ask the presenters to introduce themselves first, and then we'll go on with the presentation. Hi, I'm Carrie Gilbert. I'm a managing consultant at Daymark Energy Advisors. And John. John, you have to un unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm John Athis. I'm a uh, vice president and principal consultant at, uh, at Daymark Energy Advisors. Kerry and I were the main um, authors with a team of support um, for, the, for the report by Daymark. Great. And Kerry and John, how are you doing your presentation? Is one of you going to do it or are you both going to do it together? I'm going to just like the start kick off and probably have some slides toward the end that I, I address, but we'll have Kerry um, um, address most of it. Um, and there'll be times when I um, support her with questions by answering some of the questions that come up or, okay. or supplementing. So why don't you do your presentation? Slides are always great if you have them because it allows us to have something to take away uh, from your presentation. But go ahead, John. Okay. Here, I'm going to share the. I'll share the PowerPoint. Um, yeah. Super. Um, here we go. Okay, and um, you can go to, oops, now we're seeing both things, um, oh, Carrie. Yeah, we need to do the single screen view because some of us, Carrie, are a little bit older and we have to really read in to uh -huh. lean in to read that type. Is that is that good now? Nope, it's not. Nope. It's not. You want to go to the uh, slideshow presentation where it presents a single slide on each um Hang on. Sorry. That's okay. We'll give you a second to. Okay. Sorry. Um, somehow I've created, in attempting to show you guys a better presentation, I've created a, quite a situation on my own double screen. <laughs> why don't you uh, why don't you take some time to do it and John if you want to start off um, sure yeah that that that'd be that'd be fine um I, I, first of all we thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work um and um and we and we really hope that this just provides you with some useful information in in all the questions you guys have to answer in your roles that you play and um and you know because that's one that's our main task here uh we, um, we, after looking at the PUC's report, and I really appreciate the presentation by, by the, the chair, it was an excellent presentation um, and in, in so many ways. So I think it's, um, this is just some additional information, some additional insights. Uh, the, um, we felt that the, um, that the PUC report focused on the cost shift and the, um, you know, drawing a circle around the uh, benefits very tightly connected to rates. And that's um, that's very appropriate, um, you know, in the um, in the jurisdiction of the of the PUC. It, it probably we felt wasn't necessarily the um, the right scope from looking at trying to look at the benefits of um, of a, a very comprehensive set of benefits when you look at the um, pro, uh, types of generation that were developed under the NEB program. And so that's what our um, intent was to. Um, bring out, uh, you'll hear Kerry and I discussed that, um, but we, we definitely tried to put some quantification um, through a value of solar approach on, the, on all the benefits that some of them even mentioned by, um, by the chair that were um, outside of what they uh, valued. The um, whole, full wholesale power cost, the RNS, the emission costs and the economic development costs. So that's what you'll hear about in our um, presentation. And Kerry will take you through, um, you know, first a little bit of our viewpoint of the, of the success of the program, um, then some our analysis of the um, of the cost way we see it versus the uh, PUC building upon their work, and the um, then then the value, and then the um, then some observations we had on the program overall. 
So I'll, I'll turn it over to Carrie right now. Okay, are you guys all seeing the presentation now? We are, Carrie. The only thing is that you're having one screen and then it shows the next screen. So it's harder to read the screen. Yeah, because let, me, smaller. let me see. I, Go to the... I have, I have two screens and on one of them, I see the presentation and the other one... Yeah, I do, do, hit that swap button, it will work. It will work? There yeah. you go. Okay. Ah. okay. So now Perfect. us now us older visually challenged people can. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I I understand. Well. I'm actually visually challenged myself, so I'm always trying to push us to make our text bigger. Um, okay. So the first thing I wanted to to talk about is the success of the NAB program so far. Um, the program has been successful in stimulating clean energy development in Maine. Um, at the time of the commission report. There were a thousand megawatts of small scale solar that had made some step towards participation in the program. Um, and I think you saw uh, Chair Bartlett presented um, the, that that has only increased since we did our, did our report. Um, but at the time of the report, the operational projects were providing 1% of um, Maine's electric demand. And if all of those thousand megawatts were developed, that would reach 15% of Maine's electric demand. Um, and clean, clean energy through this program is helping to meet Maine's decarbonization goals. Um, next, we wanted to talk a little bit about the economic development benefits of the program. Um, this program represents a large investment in Maine's economy. Um, the operational projects at the time of our report have supported an estimated 549 job years and stimulated $60 million of economic activity within the state. And if all of those thousand megawatts were um, reached commercial oper operation, they would support almost 7,000 job years and $782 million of economic activity within the state. And we want to talk a little bit more about the impact of this program on uh, the uh, helping Maine to meet its climate goals. So when you add a resource such as solar to the grid, you are backing off the marginal resource in ISO New England's um, energy markets. And the marginal resource 75% of the time in the, in the real time market was natural gas generation. So all of the solar, you know, 75% of the time we're backing off solar generation. I mean, not solar, we're backing off natural gas generation. And this is currently reducing 34,000 tons of carbon annually. And if all of those thousand megawatts of projects were developed, that would be over 60 or 600,000 tons of carbon each year that's no longer being emitted. So we wanted to talk um, now about uh, our view of the commission report. Um, the commission's report was, was narrowly focused on lost utility revenue and didn't consider the fact that all lost utility revenue is, is um, necess not necessarily a cost to customers. There are some benefits that come in terms of the distribution system um, there may be distribution system cost reductions or resiliency benefits that come from adding these um, distributed resource. Chair Bartlett mentioned the locational benefit of um, adding projects in certain locations. So that would be an example there. Um, and, and then we also wanted to point out that there are other programs like energy efficiency um, that, that result in um, shifts in revenue cost recovery, but those have been, those are intentionally excluded from the evaluation of the um, energy efficiency programs by Efficiency Maine. Um, so just getting into um, our analysis a little bit, we wanted to add to the conversation um, about the benefits of this program by expanding the, um, categories in, of costs and benefits that we looked at compared to the commission analysis. So 
um, the commission analysis does not look at uh, retail generation savings, capacity savings, um, reductions in prices that main customers pay due to the additional, uh, the addition of um, a zero marginal cost resource like solar. Um, and also the report doesn't look at the value of the emissions reductions or the economic development created by the program. And so when you look at uh, the $161 million cost was widely cited um, uh, in the newspaper and, and um, <laughs> around the state. Um, but if you take these other benefits into account, that $161 million is uh, cost is actually a benefit of almost $2 million. Um, and additionally, uh, we looked at the attrition. I think Chair Bartlett mentioned potential attrition as well, but um, uh, most many projects don't make it to commercial oper operation um, due to a variety of things. Maybe they don't have customers they can sign up. Maybe there's a problem with their interconnection. Maybe who you know who knows what happens. So. The, um, the $161 million figure also is significantly less, even using the commission's narrow focus um, for if you're just looking at operational projects or operational projects and even 50% of the proposed projects. But in our um, analysis, all of, the, all of those scenarios were providing benefits to me. Um, so, just wanted to talk a little bit more about the objectives of our study. As I mentioned before, we were um, trying to create um, an analysis that could help inform the commission and people in the legislature um, about the full benefits of the program. Um, we, we looked at the benefits of, for the bulk power system, the environment and the main economy. And we tried to capture any differences that were created whether or not the project was in the kilowatt hour program or the tariff rate program. And we looked at four different scenarios um, for our study. We had a 2021 scenario where we assumed solar penetration reached 10% of peak load. And then we had three scenarios in 2030, a 10% of peak load scenario, a 25% of peak load and a 40% of peak load scenario. Um, and this, the study in general is a snapshot of the benefits of each of those years. So we have a snapshot in 2021 for the 2021 scenario and then snapshot of 2030 for the three 2030 scenarios. Um, and these are the components that we've included in our study. Um, the first three components, avoided energy, avoided capacity, and DRIPE. Um, we tried to mirror the methodology that, um, that was used in the um, avoided energy supply component study, which is a study for the whole New England region um, that many energy efficiency um, uh, program evaluators use. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about what each component is. Um, so the avoided energy is basically the market energy purchases that are avoided um, due to distributed solar or for the kilowatt hour program or it's the wholesale market um, value of solar for the tariff rate program. Um, and the avoided capacity is, is similar to avoided energy, but it's for the capacity product. And then DRIPE is <laughs> sort of a funny word, but it's basically the... Um, uh, when you add solar, it's, it's being added as a zero marginal cost resource. So it's changing the, inter this, the point at which the supply and demand curve um, interact for, um, the ener for energy and um, capacity. So it's bringing the price down. So that's what the drive effect is. Um, the avoided RNS charges are basically um, the way that ISO New England divides up the cost of the transmission system between the states. So they look at the, um, the load in each state and they look at a particular hour in each month, the peak hour. Um, but they, um, 
it's basically divided on based on what share of the load you have. And so by reducing, um, by adding energy in the kilowatt hour program, we are reducing main sh share that they have to pay of those costs. Um, and then the RPS benefit, that is um, basically the similarly reducing the load is reducing the ob RPS obligation. Um, and then the environmental benefits, um, I think those are more obvious, but basically the value of reducing air pollutant emissions, we looked at um, NOx, SOx, and carbon. And then the economic benefits are benefits to means economy. Um, then I think it's, we just wanted to sort of do a high level dive into the um, scenario results. The, the, the big point here, I think, is that all four scenarios we showed net benefits um, in both CMP and Bangor Hydro's territories and for, and for the state of Maine. Um, we did find that the kilowatt hour program um, provided uh, net benefits for all service territories and scenarios and the tariff rate program had a net, a net cost. And the, the, the real distinction between these two programs is that the, um, the kilowatt hour program is reducing load and the tariff rate program projects are treated more as generators. And that, that has some implications about how they interact with the market and, and creates higher benefits for the kilowatt hour program. And so here we're showing the supply stack not the, sorry, not the supply stack, <laughs> the value stack of benefits for each of the scenarios in each of the utilities. And so this is showing that 55% um, of the benefits about for the kilowatt hour program are coming from reducing electric costs and then, or their value in the electric, um, their value in the, the bulk power system benefits. And then the remainder are coming from the environmental benefits and the economic benefits. And then um, similarly for the tariff rate program, um, this, this program is a little different because these resources are um, providing their benefits at the wholesale level. So the, um, and the kilowatt hour program was at the retail level, but these benefits are a little bit lower just because they're the wholesale benefits um, and the categories are a little bit different because there's a couple benefits, the RNS benefit and the RPS benefit that the tariff rate um, programs don't get, but otherwise the benefits are, are very similar. Um, okay, and then John's gonna talk about the economic development piece in more detail. Yeah. Carrie, if you just back up two slides, I just yeah. just uh, just to add some supplemental, um, just just to notice because um, it was mentioned um, the uh, the cost um, on a cents per kilowatt hour basis on the rates by uh, by the chair, and so the um, we have we and it would be it would have been better act, obviously if we showed this chart in cents per kilowatt hour, but the one hundred and sixty dollars per megawatt hour there is equivalent to sixteen cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out for the um, for, for the uh, all people on the committee um, to do and and in the next slide you'll see that the um, benefits for the tariff program hover around 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour or 110 to 120 dollars a megawatt hour. So that that's the um, that's the kind of conversion from the um, to cents per kilowatt hour that you're maybe more familiar with. Um, from our dollars per megawatt hour, which is what a lot of a lot of planners use in their um, in, in as a unit of measure. So if we go into the um, um, to the slide next slide on the um, solar development, the um, the key thing here is that um, you know we tried to capture what we believe was probably the benefits that were um, fueling the discussion to even have. A solar program, and um, you know we don't believe that the that um, that a program was probably designed just to 
um, just to look at uh, an impact on rates. We certainly have seen in almost all jurisdictions that the debates and an attribute ascribed to, to solar, especially distributed solar, is the, um, is the benefits to the economy. And so we, we wanted to see if, the, if in the overall value, if the, net, uh, if the economic benefits matter. You know, are they a little piece of that, uh, of those bars, or are they a significant piece? So to quantify that benefit, we, we did an analysis using a model called Implan. It's a commercially available model. It's not something that, um, that um, Daymark developed, and it's, um, you know, and anybody can use it. There's probably maybe people within the state government that use it. Um, but it's a model, it, it models the economy with all the different inputs and outputs. It models it with, we model it with and without the solar and we try to capture all the different elements of the cost within the, um, within the, the solar projects. We modeled small projects that were for behind the meter, um, small and, and overall projects that are other community projects and, um, and proportion those out by the amount of development that we've seen in the queue. Um, and um, so there is, there is a little slightly different impact on the economy per megawatt. Um, that's a little bit higher in the um, smaller um, kilowatt hour program um, behind the meter uh, projects, but basically they're, they're, they're very similar. But what we did here is that we focused on what, what is called direct benefits. And direct benefits are one of the, the major element that comes out of the model that um, what direct benefits are is how much has been spent on the different aspects to make the project happen. Um, and, and those projects happen. How much is labor? How much is spent on outside of Maine to get bring in panels or other pieces of equipment? How much is spent um, inside of Maine on um, the construction, construction materials and, and things like that? The, there's also an indirect benefit that we do not, that is on some of our tables, but we haven't included in the value of solar stack that Kerry showed you. Um, the indirect benefits are to uh, are when you take the uh, prime contractor and they end up um, hiring other or using other businesses' equipment, like through rental of a of equipment or um, buying some other kinds of local materials and other stuff like that. That they would um, that's kind of a business to business benefit, and it's called um, the secondary or the indirect benefits. In some analyses for. Um, talking about job creation or talking about economic benefit. Um, some people choose to use the, both the direct and indirect benefits. We took the, um, because we took the uh, more um, primary benefit of the direct benefits and just use that in our, um, in our numbers that you saw in the, um, in the value stack that Kerry showed and, and throughout our, um, our table. And, and it's an analysis that takes a little bit of um, some painstaking steps to um, look at, find um, outside references for what these projects, what the elements of these project costs are. So we didn't, we didn't rely on um, any um, uh, anecdotal information. We uh, went to um, source information that are referenced in our, um, in our report for both the behind the meter and a small solar pro uh, community project of, of one megawatt. And uh, as it says here, went through and looked at all the different components of those costs and, and and made an assessment as to how, whether those are main specific or whether those are a cost that um, essentially to help the, uh, have the project happen, um, essentially go right outside of Maine. So the, um, one of our um, biggest um, metrics that, um, that comes out of this, um, which is, usually a metric that's of prime concern for people that are designing or sponsoring programs like, um, like what, anything from energy efficiency to the, um, to the NEB program is, you know, how, how is this turning out for job creation? Job creation is, um, is an output of this modeling process. Um, and it looks at, um, it looks at um, jobs associated um, in job years, which is an odd kind of parameter. Um, but, um, what you see on the chart here in our scenario, that in the 10% um, scenario today, we have about a little less than 1,200 job years. So that means if all those, um, if those 
if those projects take two years to um, primarily develop, that you're basically talking about 600 jobs in each of those two years on, on an average kind of number. When you get into the case on the far right, which is our 40% case, and you have 7,000 job years to develop projects over potentially um, over, over potentially over 10 years, that means that on average there were 700 jobs um, supported over those 10 years. And you know those are those are just examples of the math. If you think of those projects being concentrated over um, less years, obviously the jobs that are created in those given years are, are um, increase. So if you look at the um, the next one, Kerry. No, oh, actually, um, we uh, back up for one second. The, the other parameters that we um, you, you know that we look at that are documented in our report and we have we have slides of these questions on them are you know is the compensation for the that, that goes with the employment as one of the benefits that, that goes into the economy and then gets circulated around the economy uh, and the other thing is just some overall um, economic impact on the economy which is besides compensation it's it's the spent money spent on goods and um, and non-labor services associated with that. So th those numbers can total up to, um, a, you know, a rather large number. Um, the in the 10% um, range, the total output benefit is um, of the direct is about 130 million dollars. Um, that's that's going into the economy to make these projects happen, and that doesn't include the cost of the panels that are um, coming from outside. Of, that that certainly is. Uh, the major cost that goes outside of Maine, um, and again, it, if it doesn't include the, um, the the indirect benefits, so that that 130 million dollars is kind of what's happening today um, as these projects are getting developed, and some of them have already been developed and operational. If we go into the uh, into the 40 percent case, when the you know when all <clears throat> said and done, and we look around, we'll have um, created about 750. A million dollars of activity to make that um, to make those megawatts happen in the um, in scenario four. So those are just different ways to look at the economic impact, and we've um, factored those economic impact dollars in uh, um, that I just mentioned for the direct benefits into the uh, value of solar costs. So. Overall, and kind of uh, concluding, is that you know the um, the having a program that ends up in in lo load reductions, as the kilowatt hour program does, uh, increases the benefits that that are out there. Um, the um, another way to um, lower the net costs is to make sure that the value of energy and capacity um, that's created in the tariff program tariff rate projects is maximized and through participation in the wholesale markets. And um, the chair gave you an indication that that is a developing process, but it's ultimately over these long live assets, it, we expect it to happen. And we expect that the that's capacity revenues will start being realized. And, um, and the, D the PUC and the chair were corrected that today, the, um, in their analysis for the $160 million, that the, there aren't capacity revenues included because right now today those are not happening, but we expect that to happen during uh, most of the lives, uh, uh, almost all of the life of a 30 megawatt, a uh, 30, 30 year project um, existing like solar. Um, we also think that while um, at, there are the uh, benefits of the emissions and economic development that, that need to be brought out um, and they, um, from these projects, when you're looking at the um, when you're looking at the cost, we understand that in the cost allocation, um, uh, you know, problem trying to be solved that um, that the chair mentioned. Not only is it how costs get allocated within the electric system, but how does how do you deal with you, you guys have to deal with the trade offs that are there between you know costs that are incurred within the electric system and benefits that are occurred that accrue outside of the um, electric system. And that's a trade-off that, that um, um, legislatures and, um, and PUCs around the country have to make as a, as a trade-off. And we wanted to make sure that you had some of, the, um, some of that information. Uh, the, um, there also is um, a key thing here is to make sure that the utilities embrace the reality of the 
of the distributed generation and start re-engineering their distribution planning process. You know, non-wires alternatives that was mentioned is, is, um, is one element of that, but it certainly is, um, there's a different system going to be out there when you have large amounts of, of distributed generation. And the, um, the more utility um, factors in that, in that sense, a complication to their routine lives as distribution planners, but, um, but a benefit that's that can be squeezed out more is, is a very important thing in terms of getting the right value, the full value out of the NEB um, programs. Um, we, we haven't um, done our um, benefits with um, any locational benefits. Um, those, uh, when we've done that in the past at looking at things, um, sometimes the locational benefits can skyrocket the, um, the bar charts that you saw. Um, that Carrie put up there. You can add you, you can add anything from a little slither on top of it, but if you find the right location and other stuff, what is slightly beneficial in our analysis today, as in, compared to the if you using the cost value of the of the shift in revenue, um, that the um, locational value could dramatically increase the size of, of our value of solar bars. And we look forward to answering any questions that you have. Okay, and I apologize, I've lost the cursor on my screen, so I'm, you may not see my video, but I'll, uh, if you could drop the, uh, thank you. Um, anybody who has questions for on the Daymark report uh, or for Chairman Bartlett, uh, please raise your hands. There I am. No questions, I can't believe that, yes. Uh, Representative Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just trying to flip back through my pages. Um, I was wondering, I'm sorry, I'm looking, hmm, I'm looking for the name. Yes, Mr. Athos. Um, I, I'm trying to understand the, the one slide about the jobs. Um, you know, that go from current is almost 1,200 and then scenario four is the 40% of 2030 peak loads goes up to 7,000. And I'm new to all of this. So you started talking about spreading those jobs over a certain number of years. And I'm just trying to understand. And the one example you said, well, if they were spread over two years, it would be 600. And the other was if it was spread over 10. I'm just trying to understand where do the years how did they get calculated in there? Sure. Um, the, um, the economic analysis that's done with the model of, um, of, of implant and most economic models that are called input output models, they, they kind of analyze things not overstretched out over time. They analyze the, the effects of, the, um, of, where, of money flowing at times. And so they translate the amount of, um, of, labor that's required to do these, um, to, to effectively have these projects come to fruition. And they get um, a certain amount of, um, you know, full-time equivalents or other stuff as uh, in kind of a, in an overnight look. So that's, mm -hmm. but, they, but they refer to that as, as job years. Um, and um, in actuality, it takes, you know, a little more than one year to, um, you know, while they've happened pretty quick on the construction side, there's some, um, you know, planning and procurement and other stuff and administrative and selling costs that happen for these projects certainly take them to be, um, you know, make a multi-year projects. So that um, what, we, um, what we said in the first bar that there was 1,200 job years created um, for the um, projects, if you do temp get to 10% in today's, in today, um, that wouldn't happen over all the time. That would happen maybe over two, at least two years, maybe three. And if it happened over two years, you'd be averaging the 600 jobs a year, real jobs as we know them when you look at people that are happening <laughs> and hours that they put in. Um, and naturally, since, and we, since we looked out 10 years in the, um, in the development of the, um, of the projects at the 40% level, that 7,000 job years, 
isn't going to happen in one year. It's not going to be 7,000 jobs that exist for the 10 years. It's going to be an average of, if you take the, the 10 years, it's an average of 700. If you took seven years as kind of the working uh, uh, time period, it might be 1,000 a thousand jobs on average over the year. Okay, thank you. Um, so these jobs are, I think I heard you say, are bringing the projects to fru fruition. So they're more uh construction kind of jobs and not jobs that are needed over that are permanent jobs i mean there's some endpoint to these jobs yeah well there is a small amount of jobs related to um operation and maintenance obviously the operation side is very small on solar um, it's right. not exactly like a power plant where you have people going to the uh, location every day um for 24 7 but it's um, so that those numbers are you know essentially zero in in this, um, but they um, but they are jobs that um, that um, that that um, that it, it's a, the task for these for those jobs would go away, um, just like in in, in in full disclosure, um, you know we don't differentiate between um, a um, you know someone redirecting their employment. Um, efforts, <laughs> you know, from, from uh, electricians that used to work on something else now working on this, you know, uh, uh, on these solar projects. So we don't, um, we don't differentiate between yeah. preserving jobs and, um, and um, creating brand new jobs. But, yeah. but you're right that the jobs are temporal in nature. But, but yeah. probably also all of those megawatts wouldn't be installed instantaneously. So there would probably be a I mean, it'd be unlikely all the projects would get installed at the same time. So over time, you 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 could have this, you know, you could have the same 600 people installing those jobs over a longer period of time, and installing the megawatts. Um, yeah, I understand that those people just don't lose their yeah. lose their employment. I was just trying to understand the slide better and how those jobs are accounted for. Thank you. It's an important thing to, um, to um, make sure that we have gotten the right information across. Any further questions, Representative Wood? Okay, uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Mr. Mathis. Um, I guess to me, it, don't you think it's true that if we built solar at a, like a larger grid scale, uh, we get the same benefits, uh, but at like at a quarter of a cost, maybe like four cents versus uh, 15 cents. And uh, just wanted you to react to that. Um, well, we didn't, first of all, we didn't try to um, provide any information on the relative um, benefits of, of these types of projects versus anything else. Um, you know, they're, um, we were um, just looking at them relative to the um, cost that was um, identified by the by the commission, and um, you know there there may be um, it may be um, true from the standpoint of looking at costs that um, that the um, large solar and it's been discussed in many states that we've we've worked in can be looked at as having a, a lower cost per kilowatt to develop and and the like. Um, but one of the things that happens with that is usually that would make the jobs a little bit smaller. That would make um, that changes the land use trade off that are being made um, and and other things. Um, so it's um, and it changes the indiv individuality of choice. And, you know, that's one of the things that's very helpful to um, for, um, to, to get kind of a clear um, uh, picture in the, in a committee's mind as to um, as to how important um, all those different things are when you're um, when you're considering you know um, programs that sponsor one resource over another, um, such as the um, NEB solar versus other kinds of solar or renewable. Thank you. Follow up, Representative Wadsworth. Okay, any other questions? I see Representative Barry um, is raising his hand. Representative Barry. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, and and uh, thank you to Mr. Atlas and Ms. Gilbert for your presentation today. Um, 
I wonder if one of you could address the concern that was raised earlier about um, undermining uh, the our, our renewable portfolio standard um, with the way that RECs are treated as uh, un under some of these projects. Um, did you catch that part of the discussion with Chair Bartlett? Yes, we did. Um, Carrie, do you want to do that? Take that, or I can take that. Take you. Take you. Um, yeah, I did catch it. I I needed to think a little bit more about um, whether or not the benefits would go away. Um, I think the the RPS benefit that we have um, that we have quantified is basically the um, the 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 RPS obligation as it stands right now is on the load serving entity. Um, so if they're serving less load, which they are in the kilowatt hour program by having these additional resources, then they're, they're, they're needing to comply basically with less recs. So, um, I, I, I'll help you out, Carrie. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's a real effect that what was being mentioned by the chair. I mean, if let's take an extreme, if the if all the behind the meter um, people, um, you know, learned that they could they could they had this additional attribute besides that nice energy that's up on their roof that's going to work when that's um when the when the lines go down outside and everything um, that they um uh, they they have this product called the wreck and they could sell it. And, um, and offset some of their costs. If they sell that, um, or if everyone sold all those wrecks that were generated, you would have um, essentially changed the characteristic of their energy from renewable non-emitting energy to standard energy with, with uh, in, in New England on the margin, which is mostly gas, <laughs> like we said, and other stuff like that. So it would be, in that case, you'd have less renewable sponsored by the um, per unit of load in Maine than you would have if you didn't even have any NEB solar, okay? And that extreme. If, um, if some, but for, if everybody kept them, you essentially take the, um, and, and nobody had that market to trade off, and we believe that most people don't um, do that, that, um, that instead of having a 20% or 40% of the energy that needed to be renewable, these people are having 100% of their energy um, renewable. So in that case, the amount of renew amount of clean energy that gets um, used to serve the main load goes up above the RPS requirement. You know, and then you can actually find a balance point where if some of the people sell it, you're at the you're at the same point and other stuff like this. But it's um, but it's a it's a fair. Um, concern to have and to understand what's going on with the people with the um, customers that participate with their attributes and um, but it's because um, it, especially if the if a primary objective is clean energy. Great. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Athos, for the. Uh, presentation. Uh, I quite often, uh, my neighbors and my constituents uh, quite often give me, uh, ask me a question on how can these companies be sending me these uh, notices that if I will sign up for some of their energy projects, I can get 15% off of my bill. And they ask me, you know, how can they do that? Is it, you know, what's the catch? My answer as I look at as I also try to explain to myself why, when we look at grid scale solar at three and a half to four cents a kilowatt hour, why would we be willing to not uh, to pay three to five times that for these smaller projects with net metering? And I tell them, as far as I can see through this whole thing, <clears throat> it's all about the money and it's all about where that money's going. It's not about carbon reduction, because I, unless you can explain to me how these projects offer any more carbon reduction than a grid scale project, uh, it's not necessarily about jobs, although I certainly would rather pay less to have some of this installed, considering the uh, concern we have for how soon we need to do this and, and with how much we can get for our dollar. So I guess um, um, my question is, 
uh, am I wrong in my assumption that it's really all about the money and where these dollars are going, that we are trying to uh, continue this net metering uh, portion of 1711, which by the way, when I testified and put a floor amendment in to make the whole bill uh, available for grid scale uh, uh, bidding, which would have, at that time, we didn't know it was gonna come in at three and a half to four cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, uh, I said that if this is that much of a concern for the people of Maine, for their health, for our environment, then we should do what we can as quickly as possible with what money we have. So my question is, am I, am I wrong in, in any of that? Thank you. Well, uh, I'll start out, Carrie, you can um, supplement. Um, I mean, I, I think everything you said is, um, is, is, is true. Um, there are some additional things to, to, um, to say, you know, first of all, um, you, but you did mention at the end that as, do things as quick as you can, you know, on, on the emission side, um, quick really matters um, as because the amount of ca carbon is a cumulative effect. So that the, the quicker that you put in um, non-emitting, non-carbon emitting resources, the, um, the less carbon that's out in the air for, forever. <laughs> so it's, um, so it's, um, so it, there's definitely a real, real effect there. And generally the, um, the uh, programs uh, for net metering around the country um, are considered um, more quickly scalable and more quickly um, um, implemented for um, for getting megawatts than um, than utility um, grid connected utility size or grid connected size you know tens of megawatts or more uh, of solar because they provide less complicated interconnection issues and other things like that and and um, and land use issues and 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 the like so that um, that scalability that flexibility in the um, in, in small scale solar is generally viewed as something that gets the, gets the kilowatt hours to market quicker um, and has that some environmental benefits from that regard. Another thing about the money that's there, as you said, is you know who's making the, the money commitment and for how, at, at, over time, especially. You know, when, you, um, when we talk about um, leveraging private capital and other stuff, there really isn't a um, commitment that uh, infusion of capital has to come from um, even capital potentially coming from share from customers or from ratepayers or from the from the government to make these um, smaller projects happen, and 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 you could it could be viewed as very similar when you go to large scale and you acquire the energy by a, a purchase power agreement, but that that purchase power agreement usually comes with a commitment of an underlying commitment by. Um, by the utilities in some states that um, are procuring um, solar, um, solar sca uh, grid scale solar, and that that thirty year commitment to take that power is um, is um, you know is a financial effect is is using um, some sort of financial resource that the um, that the state of Maine has or it's the state of Maine's taxpayers or the state of Maine's customers have. And um, so it, it's a, li a little different use of money that comes about by the um, by the grid scale, um, but than it does by the um, behind the meter. Those are two things that I'd offer as um, you know supplemental to the way you were thinking. Yeah, the the only other thing I would add too is just the siting differences between a large scale project and a net energy billing project. You can imagine, you know, maybe a town is putting. Uh, project on their landfill that's land that's you know unused that could be part of the net energy billing program um, whereas a large-scale project is going to potentially have more trouble finding a site it might take longer um, to to um, to get built for that reason yeah I mean Carrie and I do a lot of evaluations for you um, with for commissions around um, when the utilities are looking at procurements for um, um, those kinds of uh, solar projects that you're talking about are the alternatives ones that have some lower um, bus bar costs than the um, than behind the meter solar. And one thing we've never seen is we've never seen anybody promote propose um, 
um, taking the developing their project by putting um, using rooftops rather than land. <laughs> you know, it's always um, it's always land somewhere, and um, and there's and there's full size interconnections and things like that. So it, there's a difference that has has some degree of trade off rather than um, than just looking at the dollars. Representative Foster, did you have any follow up? Yes, uh, it, uh, it did bring to mind one other aspect of this. And again, getting back to the amount of money that uh, the net metering projects bring in, I am concerned. Uh, uh, it was mentioned that uh, using landfill spaces seems like a very reasonable opportunity. And I would agree with that. But I am very concerned that I find uh, because of the money that's being paid, the amount that's available under these contracts, that good farmland in, in my area is being turned over to these projects because of the amount of money that's available to pay the farmers versus uh, what was valuable cropland. And uh, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what, what you might say to that, because that, I think, is a result of the amount of extra money that is being paid for this uh, energy versus uh, grid scale. Thank you. Well, I, you, you, you're welcome. Uh, first thing I'd point out is that we did not evaluate any of that, that issue at all within here. I mean, what we tried to focus on was that the, um, you know, all the projects that are, um, are happening because of, uh, and in the, in the queue to happen uh, as a result of the NEB program as structured now, um, producing um, an aggregate of all these categories benefits that um, that are you know where does that benefit stand relative to the amount of uh, of cost as the cost parameter was identified by the by the PUC so or the commission so so we we haven't addressed that that's that's a um, that's a fair consideration I know it's come up in um, in other um, other locate. Um, the states and other things like this. It's it's one variant of the locational issue that was mentioned a lot during the discussions with the chair. Great. Uh, any follow up, Representative Foster? Okay, Representative Grohowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a, a quick statement on that topic before I proceed to my question. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to remind committee members uh, from the previous session and also let new members know that we did have a discussion about prime farmland soils and in our last session. And I do think we could do better with locational planning and with thinking about all the different values of the land in front of us. But what this committee decided at that time was that we did not want to tell farmers in which ways they could profit off of their land because we know that farming is a very challenging uh, industry in the state and in this country. So that's the history on that decision. It was something that was discussed. Um, and additionally, my experience in Ellsworth with looking at possible places to develop solar for the municipality, uh, landfills are much more expensive. So unless we, uh, to develop because they're capped and you have to, um, install the solar panels in a different way. Uh, if we're interested in developing these sort of brownfield type sites that are more challenging, we might need to look at a different system or incentivize that in a different way to overcome those costs. Um, <clears throat> to my question, I, I really struggle with this concept that we always talk about of lost revenue and that the utilities, there is a certain cost to have the entire grid infrastructure and that is divided out in what we hope is a fair way amongst all the ratepayers. We talk a lot about lost revenue that could happen because of real or perceived cost shifts, I suppose, could happen if I suddenly buy a lot of energy efficient um, appliances in my house. It could happen if I'm out of my house for six months a year when I've been in my house year round. And we always talk about that sort of lost revenue, but what I don't hear us talking about and what I don't see the effect of in my own rates is gained revenue. What happens as we um, install many heat pumps? We know that we're a national leader in installing heat pumps. And so I would assume that's gained revenue to the utilities. And yet I don't see my costs going down at all. So I think this is a question to Chair Bartlett, but how can we balance? Uh, it seems like we're always talking about this one type of shift, but there is, I believe, another shift happening. And I don't see that ever encapsulated in this bigger picture discussion that we're having about how do we make this transition affordable? 
I'm only seeing one side and how can we capture that gain revenue and how are we benefiting as rate payers as more and more electricity is being used. And I remember um, what was then Amara speaking to us and saying, we can handle as many heat pumps as you guys are planning to put on our portion of the grid without needing to build any additional grid space. So I would hope our costs would go down and yet they seem to stay the same or go up. And then we nitpick about these <laughs> other, and, and nitpick's not the right word, but we focus, it seems like on one side, but we're driving demand um, and not seeing a benefit from that. So could you speak to how we can, it's a, it's a, it's a broad thought experiment type question, but I'm just really hung up that we always focusing on the one side and I'm not hearing anything with the other. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with you in a big picture um, sense on that. Absolutely. I think um, one, th one of the reasons that I suggest thinking about how much do you think ratepayers could afford to pay at a time is because if you think that, okay, for example, we're going to designate 10% of a delivery bill that's going to be used to build out for all these investments we want to make, right? Well, as people electrify, as that load grows, that number is also going to grow, right? So you're, you're going to have, you're going to be taking into account the fact that there's load growth um, in that percentage rate. So I do think that that's sort of why I try to think about it in those terms, like how much at a time can we handle while we bring on more load, which will help us to spread that cost out more. So I think that's a very valid point. I do think it comes down to scale to some degree. Um, you know, there are certainly people coming on and off the grid all the time. Uh, but I think when you're talking about a system that is 2100 megawatt peak system, and you have potentially a sudden change for 500, 1,000 or more megawatts of distributed resources, that's a pretty significant shift, that cost shift that you're going to see um, as a result of bringing all of that generation on. So I think that's, the, that's sort of the point uh, behind it. I also think there's something fundamentally different between efficiency and these larger distributed projects. If I make investments in energy efficiency in my home, I'm permanently reducing my demand curve, permanently reducing uh, the amount of electricity I'm sort of drawing off of the grid on a day-to-day -day basis. When you are, if I were to subscribe, I got a mailer the other day, I can subscribe, I live in Portland, I can subscribe to a solar facility in Baldwin. Um, that, if I subscribe to that, that is in no way going to change how I'm interacting with the grid. I've not shifted my demand on my circuit uh, in, in my city. Um, so there's not, the way I'm interacting with the grid is exactly the same as it was before. So I do think that it's important to see that distinction. Um, one other point if I could raise real briefly is that the, the point that um, I think Mr. Alice raised about long-term contracting for large renewables versus the distributed resources. Um, I when you look at the CNI program, we are committing to paying that tariff rate every single year that that project is in operation. So I do just want to point out that that is very similar. You know, it's not a, a contract for set amount, um, but it is uh, a permanent amount of money they're going to get every single year. And if anything, it's, it's likely to increase over time as delivery rates increase. So I think the kilowatt hour program is different. I think a traditional um, solar on your rooftop or uh, other sort of behind the meter kilowatt hour credit programs, I think are fundamentally different. Uh, but I just wanted to raise that as um, an important consideration. Other questions in the call, are you all set? All set for the, mo the moment. Okay, Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, I'm, I wanna direct this question to, to, to you, Chair Bartlett. Um, and it's regarding the, the value of solar um, that is that is calculated, uh, you know, here in the Daymark study, and previously in a 2015 report that was commissioned uh, by the PUC, and it was actually uh, a follow-on to a bill uh, sponsored by our own Senator Vitelli. Um, previously, um, the study in 2015, which is still on the PUC's website under the electricity page, um, indicates that the 25-year levelized cost of our, our value uh, of solar, uh, if you include the externalities that were discussed here today, um, such as avoided emissions, 
um, is 33.7 cents, I believe. It might be 0.8. Um, Daymark here today has, um, you know, put that number uh, a lot lower. They indicated it was around 16 cents. Can you speak to the um, that value of solar study earlier? Um, what specific uh, infirmities you you find um, in that study, and um, I may have a follow up as well. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I I wasn't involved in sort of putting that together, uh, but I I think uh, it's it's older. I mean, it's a 2015 versus 2021, so I think that may matter. I think, um, and I want to be very clear that I think Daymark makes a compelling case for the value of solar. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question that there are significant economic benefits, environmental benefits, and wholesale market supply price benefits from solar. Um, you get that from the grid scale and you get that from distributor resources. I think the key question here is going to be how much of that benefit do you want to achieve through distributed resources versus how much you want to achieve through grid scale? And I think that requires more refinement in terms of understanding what is this added value that DERs are providing? What are these locational benefits, which I think are significant and resilience benefits? How do we target a program that makes sure that we are getting uh, the maximum amount of those kinds of benefits that are unique to DERs, because that's why they're so important. I mean, it's why I think that DERs are a critical part of our, our energy future, um, but I think it, it needs a more refined locational approach than these kinds of studies can achieve. Follow up, Representative Barry. Uh, yeah, I guess, I think, I think, um... You know, if, if I, Representative Foster um, suggested earlier that it's all about the money, and I, I, I agree with him. I think it is all about the money. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe the question I have for you, uh, Chair Bartlett, is, is um, are you confident that we can um, adequately uh, design rates that truly do capture um, accurately the, uh, the, the the true value, um, the precise value of resources like distributed energy um, in the future. And, and maybe there are specific examples where you, you, you believe that's happening that we can look to. I think that I think data is important. I think that's why the grid modernization study is going to prove to be important to help us understand what it's going to take on the grid to integrate more resources. Uh, and how, what kind of data is needed to help guide those choices to get the most value. So I think, to me, that's a, a major focus uh, for the, co the commission over the next year, is trying to get a better handle on that, because I think it will really inform uh, the policy choices that you have. Anything Thank else, you. Representative Barry? I'll say thanks. Representative Foster? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Commissioner. Violet, again, uh, thank you. Uh, when uh, the bids were put out for LD1711 on the grid scale side, did the PUC have any problems getting interest in uh, filling those contracts? Um, no, there's been the overwhelming uh, interest in the, or very significant interest in the first, and uh, we are seeing uh, significant interest in the second tranche as well. And uh, is there any difference in the amount of carbon reduction from a kilowatt hour of grid scale power versus the power, the solar power that comes from the net metering side? Um, not to my knowledge. And I do think it's important too that some of these larger projects are not necessarily singly located. Um, so you could have a bid for a, a grid scale contract that has 10 megawatts in one place, 20 megawatts somewhere else, and that is brought together um, under a single bid proposal. And we did see some of that. And, and finally, just thank you, uh, Chair Byler. Finally, just to clarify, my position is that the uh, main issue, the deciding factor here is the difference in the money between grid scale and net metering and not the money necessarily in general. So I just want to clarify that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for either Daymark or uh, Chair Bartlett? 
I, oh, Representative Barry. Um, I, I guess for for Chair Bartlett, um, the the point was also made by um, Daymark that um, not all revenue lost to the utility is necessarily um, a cost to ratepayers. Um, there's been a lot of discussion today about grid scale versus uh, DG. Um, I think I, I think we all do understand that there is is more profit uh, for the utility in transmission investment, um, which is easier to justify with, with uh, you know, the, the, the larger scale renewables. It does increase the rate base over time, even if the initial investment is made by the developer. But um, I, I think the, the, the key um, distinction there um, is, is, is in that sentence by Daymark. And I just wanna ask you, um, your response to that notion that uh, revenue loss to the utility, or you know, we can call it uh, profits um, foregone to the utility, um, does not necessarily have to be reflected as a cost to ratepayers. Can you respond to that? I think to, I think it's a two-part answer. On the one hand, yes, those revenues will get distributed to the ratepayers, but Daymark does point out there are some places where there will be offsets for that. For example, um, and I think a lot of the benefits that they highlight really focus on the kilowatt hour program. So I would urge you to think about um, how you might treat the two differently um, because the kilowatt hour program is clearly um, providing significantly more benefit. Uh, but so for example, the trans, you know, by reducing uh, our peak load, that reduces the transmission assessment. Um, again, you're not likely to see a direct reduction, but it's going to reduce the, the rate of increase in all likelihood. So that's a benefit that helps to cover a little bit of that. But I think, you know, I don't, what I would, the challenge I have, I think, is if you look at the um, bar charts that uh, were Daymark provide on the benefits, most, almost all of those are achieved from grid scale and distributed resources. And that's in large part because a lot of the avoided costs are hard to quantify because they're so location specific. And I think that's, um, to me, the nub of the issue is that um, from a long-term uh, strategic perspective, we've got to figure out how to put these resources where we can bring the, the most value out of them, particularly if they're going to be more expensive uh, to support than the grid scale. It's not to say you shouldn't be supporting distributed resources. It's, it's a matter of figuring out how do we get the absolute best bang for the buck for the rate pair? Thank you. Representative Barry, any follow-up? Okay, before we let you go, whoops, Representative Gorhowski. My apologies. I only said I was done with questions for the moment. So thank you for indulging me. Um, firstly, it sounds like you need to hire a GIS specialist to do some locational planning. I happen to know a few, so just let me know if you need to. <laughs> I'm not actually looking for a job, but I'd be happy to review any sort of uh, job descriptions that they'd be accurate and get what you're looking for. Um, I 100% agree that we need to be thinking always, always about location and space and planning is so important. So I'm really excited that we're seemingly embarking on, on that. Um, one of the things I'm looking for a little clarity on, and I'll admit I don't know a lot about, I think, Chair Bartlett, you had a slide about... Um, the capacity market and as these resources come online, they are providing a certain capacity uh, that ISO New England has a market for. We know that it, they maybe are not of the same um, value in that market as a generator that can generate on demand uh, because of the intermittency. But what I, what I heard you say was that that's sort of forming and we're not really sure about all that. On the other hand, I'm hearing from some developers that they have been able to access that. I've been told that um, when developers in Maine sign a net energy billing agreement, they give that capacity uh, to the um, T&D essentially. So, and the T&D is maybe not going to market. So um, I'm just wondering, are we optimizing every aspect of these agreements that already exist? I mean, we've we have a question ahead of us of how do we maybe improve the process going forward, but it seems like there's money on the table that would take the cost down for some of these um, net energy billing agreements that isn't even, it might not be significant, but a couple could be a couple cents, but 
I guess I wonder why is it that the utility gets this capacity? They're not doing anything with it. Why not give it to the developer to do something with, and then they could save a little money and bring their costs down. And, and how do we as a legislature, or you as a PUC affect that? Well, so I think the, for one thing, the capacity values have been dropping precipitously. Um, so I, I'm not, so they don't necessarily have um, extraordinary value, but there is value there. I absolutely agree. The issue is how they, you can take these DER resources and participate in the market because it's not going to be cost effective to do it on a resource by resource basis. And FERC happily has finally recognized this and required all RTOs across the country to permit um, to permit distributed resources to be aggregated and possibly with storage, we're still trying to figure that out um, in some way that they can then be bid in the market to take advantage of it. So that is coming. Um, ISO is, New England is currently working out the rules right now. We're engaged sort of in discussions with them and following it, but it's gonna be a while before those rules are, rules are developed. Once they are, we'll, be able to, we'll then be able to tease out exactly what, how much benefit there is and I, the one caution that I note in the slide is that there is some risk to it, that when you uh, bid into the capacity market, you are committing to provide that. So if a DER were to go offline or something were to happen um, that the utility and the PUC have absolutely no control over, um, ratepayers would have to pay the cost of any penalties associated with, with non-performance. So we have to factor that in. And I think so it's, it's going to be a sort of a cost cost benefit analysis there to figure out what the appropriate risk level is. Do we bid it all in? Do we bid half of it in? Like what's the, what's going to be the appropriate um, way to do it in the context of, of the rules that, that we have, but certainly going forward, we could consider um, alternatives to having it um, being turned over to the utilities, but that's kind of where we are at the moment. And I, but I do think there's value here and we will see value um, down the road, but it's, it's probably going to be a year or two before we have a clear understanding of what that value is. Representative Grohowski, any follow up? Um, no question, but I, I wonder if there's less risk to leave it with the developers than to have it be with the ratepayers and the utilities um, to determine how to aggregate their own and make their own investment risks, perhaps. I don't know. I think you can't, on an individual level, it's going to be hard, right? If you're a developer and you have 15 or 20 megawatts spread out um, in distributed resources, it may not be worth it to go through the market um, to try to sell that, given how much capacity prices have been dropping. So I think that's the issue. They really have to be aggregated, uh, aggregated uh, in order to, to be worth going to the market with them. I'll send Representative Grohowski. Okay, before I go on to my two questions, any other questions from the committee? Okay, a quick question now, maybe you mentioned it at the start, but uh, who paid for the Daymark uh, study? I'm sorry, that's the Coalition for Community Solar Access. The Coalition for Community Solar Access? Yep. Okay. And um, this is more for uh, Chairman Bartlett and, and Daymark. It's more of a, a kind of, not an obscure question, but one I don't think there's a specific answer to, but a lot of our uh, work on this committee is we have to deal with long-term policy and long-term policy implications of what we do. Um, and I've always felt that there's a long-term, well, I've always believed in the concept I learned in, in economics, which is opportunity costs. Oftentimes in short-term economic models, opportunity cost is not factored in. And it seems like in this area, um, there's an opportunity cost over here if we do not shift to renewables, because we will be paying in the long run, long, higher costs for carbon-based fuel production of electricity. To what extent can we factor it into studies like the PUC and Daymark has done? I'll probably leave it to Daymark on the, on the modeling around that. I think it, it I think there's there's two opportunity costs here, right? There's the opportunity cost of not acting. And we know that there, the costs of climate change are gonna be enormous. And exponentially higher if we don't act. 
Um, but there's also within individual decisions, there's an, economic, there's an opportunity cost for anything you invest in. You're obviously uh, using those resources that you can use somewhere else. So it's, it's an important concept. And uh, I hope Daymark has some good modeling advice for us. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we mentioned in our report that we didn't try to quantify is, is the, um, the price issue that you're just talking about, exposure to the price. That, you know, some people call it the hedge, the hedge benefit that you can get with solar and solar in general. You know, I'm not trying. Uh, and um, as, 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 the, as the chair has pointed out, a lot, a lot of the benefits that we have, some of the benefits that we have stacked up against the cost of the NAB program do come um, with other solar um, projects uh, procured in different manners. But uh, so the, there is a, um, um, a, a, a definitely a reduced um, exposure to um, spikes in, in uh, or, or trends that would, ri that would raise um, um, gas and um, well, less oil prices, but gas prices in the future that you, um, that you get when you um, go to a fixed price, a fixed cost resource like solar. Um, so that's that's definitely a case. There is the um, you know one of the opportunity costs. Uh, I think I think the chair was referring to the fact that you know acting now um, because in the future we're going to have um, you know the, the effects of of like carbon could be um, higher alike. But you know and that's I mentioned it to um, um, to uh, one of the early uh, questions that might have been uh, Representative Foster that you know the the uh, the cumulative effects of carbon uh, you know are real and you know so so acting now and doing stuff sooner and doing getting stuff done quicker and other stuff as part of the overall portfolio approach that um, Maine's going to take toward um, decarbonization you know just you know gets rid of the, gets rid of the total amount of carbon some of the total carbon that's in the air you know that's going to be in the air by doing that it's you know when you get if you converge that down to 20 to your goal of zero carbon you know you're not um, the, the carbon that was emitted before isn't going to come out I would agree with you, John. And I was talking even beyond just simply that, beyond the costs of using carbon to produce energy. We use carbon in our economy for many different things, in farming, in plastics, in so many different resources. And as we diminish the supply of carbon on our planet, the costs of those are gonna go up. So the cost of doing nothing will not only affect us in the energy market, but it will affect us in all other aspects of our economy. And those are very difficult things to quantify. And you know, down the road, I think we as a committee have to figure out a way to kind of look at that too as well. Okay, that's my last moment of Zen uh, for the committee. Um, we're going to thank uh, Daymark. That was a great presentation and thank uh, Chairman Bartlett for his great presentation and for hanging out here through the whole thing. It is now 1121, we've missed our morning break. Um, for the committee members, how many are available? What's your availability this afternoon? Just chime in, anybody unavailable this afternoon? Uh, only due to other bills that uh, I'm involved with, but I'll be available part-time. To come in back and forth, okay, Paige. Uh, I have to leave at three o'clock. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? I have to leave at four. That's Barb. You have to leave at four. Um, anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, I, so, I got to leave at four as well, but that's I'm around okay. all afternoon, Mr. Chair. So I'm thinking we may be able to go to three today. Uh, it sounds like that with people coming in and out. Um, I am thinking, and I don't know what Representative Barry thinks, we're at 11.22 now. We missed our morning break, but we could break caucus and combine it with our lunch break and say we're coming back at, say, I don't know, 12.30 to uh, commence our work sessions. What do people think about that? Looks good, Representative Wadsworth for the Republicans. I don't see anybody, um, you know, making gestures at me other than Representative Wadsworth. Um, so why don't we do that? Why don't we break uh, till 1230 um, to do our work sessions that we were scheduled to do at 11. I'll just ask um, that people grab lunch and um, caucus um, at the same time. 
Um, so we do, we're able to complete that. Okay, so everybody, uh, don't forget to stop your video and mute yourself. And I will see you back at 1230.
Okay, it's 12.30, so folks could turn their video back on, just have a sense of uh, quorum. We hope to be taking at least a couple of votes today, one, one or two, anyway. <clears throat> Great. Okay, we have a quorum. Excellent. Um, so for this afternoon, there are uh, five uh, bills that we will take up at least for discussion. Um, I'm not sure we'll go into work session on uh, most of them. I think we have more, it's a more a status update um, and then a vote to be scheduled um, at, a, at, a, at a near but later date. Uh, we're going to begin with LD 507, which is out of order from the, the list that we were all sent earlier. Um, the other bills will be taken up in the order that was advertised, but <clears throat> we wanna begin with LD 507 uh, because it uh, does pertain to the Attorney General's office and we have uh, the Attorney General or an Assistant Attorney General with us to discuss that portion of it. So, um, uh, LD 507, um, we, uh, Deirdre, remind me, have you presented an analysis already on this? <clears throat> I have. So can you just give us kind of a status update? Sure. Uh, so um, if just as a reminder, this was an act to improve consumer protections for community solar projects. Um, at the work session, the committee had discussed sort of the, the issue raised by the PUC that they felt that some provisions within the bill were more suited to AG enforcement and some provisions were more suited to PUC enforcement. So the committee had directed me to work on an amendment with the parties. Um, I had drafted an amendment, which I distributed to members about an hour ago. And that amendment had been reviewed by PUC, OPA and the AG, and then it incorporated suggestions from the AG um, to address a couple issues they had and to clarify a few provisions um, specifically. Um, do you want me to go through that amendment or is that enough of a status update? Um, I, I think it might be useful okay. to actually do a screen share and just okay. walk us back through that amendment. Okay. Um, got a lot of screens here. Hold on. <laughs> okay. And close that out. Let me expand this. There we go. Okay, so for the so this would replace what is currently section two of the bill. Um, in the bill itself, it had sort of language that said the commission shall establish by rule protections for consumers. So this takes a little bit of a different tact and sort of says, you know, in order to protect customers, a project sponsor, and then it lists these A through I requirements for the project sponsor. So the project sponsor must obtain a customer's explicit affirmative authorization before serving the customer, must provide to a residential customer such information as the commission may require by rule or order in a standard disclosure form before entering into an agreement with the residential customer to participate in an energy billing arrangement based upon a shared financial interest in a distributed generation resource, must allow a customer to rescind the decision to participate in a net energy billing arrangement based upon a shared financial interest in a distributed generation resource orally or in writing within five days of receipt of the first bill or invoice, must not collect or seek to collect unreasonable costs from a customer who is in default, must comply with any other applicable standards or requirements adopted by the commission by rule or order, may not release to any other entity other than for purposes of debt collection or credit reporting pursuant to state and federal law or law enforcement agencies pursuant to lawful process, any personal information regarding that customer, must comply with the Maine Unfair Trade Practices Act, must comply with all applicable provisions of the Federal Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and must comply with all federal and state laws, federal regulations, and state rules regarding the prohibition or limitation on telemarketing. These are, for the most part, the same provisions that was in the original bill, the AG did add a couple of pieces. So in A, the explicit affirmative authorization that was added by the AG to make it explicit. Um, they did add, they changed the rescission date in C. So that used to be five days in receipt of the decision of the customer participate to five days in receipt of the first bill or invoice. Um, 
And then I think they added another explicit in this provision as well. So generally these are the same, um, the way the bill is structured now, A through E would be under the PUC's jurisdiction for enforcement and F through I would be under the um, P of the uh, AG's enforcement authority. There is still, um, I think some disagreement about D specifically. So um, originally when we had our discussions in our work session, the PUC identified D as being something that they felt was more suited to the wheelhouse of the AG because they looked at it as more of a contract dispute issue. Um, the AG's office came back and thought that was better suited for the PUC because the collection of unreasonable costs wasn't 100% clear and they thought that would be something that could be developed in rulemaking. And um, the Office of the Public Advocate, I think, had some thoughts on it and had included that language because it mirrors the same language um, in current law now for the competitive electricity providers. Um, I will note PUC sort of has made a point about the competitive electricity provider language and specifying that they license CEPs currently and that they have this longstanding sort of regulation of them. And so that it's clear what their what their roles are. And now, you know, they don't license project sponsors and they're not understand, they're not sure of the universe of things that may come up as issues um, in this particular instance. And lastly, there's the enforcement provision now, which kind of reiterates what I said that A through E would be under the PUC's jurisdiction. And then if the PUC has reason to believe that a project sponsor had violated E through I, that they would report that to the AG for appropriate action. And then another addition from the AG was the inclusion of a violation of subsection five as a violation of the Maine Unfair Trade Practices Act. And currently not all A through I under the current Maine Fair Trade Practices Act would be a violation of that, but they thought that by putting that in there affirmatively, um, it would give people a private right of action as well. So that if you know the PUC or the AG didn't take appropriate action according to that person, that they would have another avenue to seek some um, help through a private right of action. And then lastly, the amendment includes since the rules under this particular provision of law are major substantive, um, it allows the PUC to adopt routine technical rules for the purposes of conforming to this act. So if they had to make any changes to, the, to their rules to incorporate anything from this bill, if it goes forward, they can do that as a one-time routine technical rulemaking. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Schneider. And um, given that I, I'm aware uh, that he has uh, limited time this afternoon for us, um, I do want to bring in the Assistant Attorney General, uh, Chris Taub, and uh, invite him to comment on the portion that pertains to the Attorney General's office. Um, so Jordan, if you can beam Chris up, that would be great. I just changed him over to panelists, so it should be happening great. shortly. There he is. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, we'll, we'll bring in the, the PUC and the, and the public advocate shortly, I'm sure. Um, so welcome, uh, Mr. Taub, and, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, can you just comment on the, uh, on the, the amendments um, from the perspective of the Attorney General's office? Sure, and good afternoon. And, and uh, just to be clear, I have all the time that the committee wants today. So uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer whatever questions the committee has or provide whatever information the committee thinks would be helpful. Um, so I think Deirdre did a good, a job, a, a good job explaining what our suggestions are. Some of them are really just very technical. Uh, I won't even bother um, describing those. Um, the, the suggestion that we had about explicit affirmative authorization, I mean, that's just really to make clear that, um, that there's no, that there's no you know, question about whether or not the consumer somehow passively agreed or you know, that, the, um, that, that, the, um, that the, um, the company doesn't make some argument that there was some sort of implicit authorization. Um, on the Unfair Trade Practices Act, um, one thing that I'm not sure is always appreciated is that is that our consumer protection division is extremely small. It's actually only um, one division chief, Linda Conti, and then four AAGs. So, so it's just a total of, of five attorneys in that division. And, and they do a pretty broad swath of work. They do uh, antitrust work. 
Uh, one position is almost full-time tobacco work. They do public charities. Uh, they do a lot of multi-state cases. Uh, right now, they're very busy with opioid-related litigation. Uh, and then they also bring sort of the, the classic deceptive marketing, deceptive trade practices cases, just for example, like, like a case against a builder who, you know, didn't deliver the products that he or she promised to the consumers. So, so it's a very small division with a lot of work. Um, so one of our suggestions was to make clear in the act that, that a violation of the law would be a violation of the Maine Unfair Trade Practices Act because the UTPA provides for a private cause of action. So if for whatever reason, neither, you know, the PUC nor the AG's office has the resources or for whatever reason just isn't in a position to, to bring an action, um, that that provision would allow an individual plaintiff or it could be a class action by, by, by individuals. It, it would allow the individuals to, to enforce the requirements that this, that this law is going to be Im, imposing on, the, um, on these pooled solar projects. Um, I'm just thinking of anything else. Um, we did think, you know, that there, there are certain areas that are, that are better suited for us, other areas that are, that are better suited for the PUC. With respect to the, um, the issue that Deirdre flagged about um, collecting unreasonable costs from a customer who was in default, it, it wasn't really clear to us what the intent was of that provision, um, whether these would be sort of like collection costs, like the cost of going to court to try to get, um, get with the, the money that the customer owes, or whether it'd be sort of more technical costs, like, like costs that the collaborative incurred. So if it's the latter, that seems like a very technical issue that the PUC would probably be, be better suited to, to enforce. Um, if it's something else, then it might make sense for our office to, to handle that. But again, we just really weren't clear on, on what the intent was of that provision. Um, so let me pause there and, and see if there are any questions or any other information I could provide. Any other questions for Mr. Taub? Comments, concerns on this section? I, uh, there's, there's one thing I forgot to mention, and Deirdre mentioned this, but I, I just want to explain why we added it. Um, the, the original provision in paragraph C allowed rescission within five days of the initial decision. And our suggestion is to change that to five days of receipt of the first bill or invoice. And, and our thinking is that a, a customer may not really know um, what they signed up for until they see that first bill. Um, so, so that's why we think it makes more sense for the rescission to be triggered um, when, when the customer first gets that bill and really understands sort of the, the, the ramifications of what they've signed up for. Great, thank you. Any discussion from the committee? Um, okay, I, I think, um, Mr. Tob, if you could stay with us, uh, um, that would be great. And thank you for your uh, availability. Um, it's always dangerous with this committee to make yourself available for the whole afternoon, but we do appreciate it nonetheless. Um, and uh, uh, at some point, I, I, I want to hear from the public advocate about um, his intent with respect to that section that Mr. Tob was concerned about needed some additional definition on. Uh, but maybe we could start with, let's see, I, I don't see Mr. Hobbins' video. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. You're with us. Uh, Mr. Hobbins, did you hear, um, welcome, first of all, uh, and, and did you hear Mr. Tob's uh, sort of question about the, the intent there um, on, on cost? And I think you're muted. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Barry Hobbins, public advocate for the record. Uh, first, let me say uh, how impressed I was uh, with the cooperation that our office had uh, with, with Christopher Taub, Chris Taub and the Attorney General's office and also uh, Mitch Tenenbaum. Um, I, th there's been negotiations going back and forth and I think the coordination and the cooperation has been excellent. I will defer to um, Kara Ridden, our consumer advisor, who helped negotiate and had an ongoing, an ongoing situation with uh, with the parties. I believe, I believe that um, Drew Landry is also 
um, been signed up. And so if he if he's there, I'm going to defer it to him also. I'm not seeing Mr. Landry. He's been he's got about two other things going on, but um, got it. I think I believe that even I would see. I believe that um, Kira is on. Okay, can we bring up uh, Kira Bearden, please? Uh, to, I guess uh, Jordan or Izzy, either one of you can do that. Great. And um, just while while Kira is joining us to give her a, a moment to catch her breath from uh, being beamed through uh, cyberspace. Uh, Mr. Tannenbaum, can you comment on this portion of it from the PUC's perspective? Uh, <clears throat> yes. No. Um, uh, anyway, good afternoon, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I'm Mitch Tannenbaum with the uh, PUC. Uh, yeah, we have the same confusion that uh, the Attorney General's office has regarding that provision and what it's in intended to mean. Okay. And you know, uh, normally there'd be damages in a contract, right? And damages would be, you know, it's governed by law. What is the reason for damage? Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway, I'm not sure what that language is intended to mean. And and this is this is sort of a new a new animal. It's in between um, uh, the the two worlds of of uh, what the PUC and what the Attorney General are accustomed to. It sounds like it sounds like so. Um, Ms. Reardon, can you can you shed any light on the, the public advocate's intent? Um, you know, given your involvement with this issue. And thanks Absolutely. for joining. Absolutely, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today on this. I think the the calls that I've been receiving and the conversations that I've had led our office to have a number of concerns that felt like the early world of competitive electricity providers. So when we had an opportunity to put this bill forward, our goal was to mirror as many of the statutory changes that we had in place for competitive electricity providers in the community solar realm, because you know we've worked really hard to be one of the, the leading states in consumer protections and competitive electricity providers. So we felt like we had a really good base there. And this language comes directly from the competitive electricity provider statute. Um, so we were hoping to give as many authorities to the commission to address in rulemaking as they already had in the competitive electricity provider world. Great, that's that's helpful. So, um, Mr. Tannenbaum, I'm going to go back to you and um, just ask you to clarify, give shed a little more light on why um, why it's it's hard for you to sort of just ad adopt a parallel um, model here from the regulator's perspective. Uh, well. Uh, I mean, it, you know, the language is there, we'll deal with it the way we deal with it in the CEP context. Um, this really does seem to get down to the actual contract between the sponsor and the customer, which is not something we generally deal with. Um, and again, contract issues might be more for the AG's office than, than for us, but, you know, if it comes up, we can deal with it like we do in, with CEPs. But with CEPs, this issue hasn't come up. What really comes up is the marketing issues and the representations or misrepresentations that are made when, uh, you know, during marketing uh, efforts, uh, not really the actual contracts. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here and putting in some work um, to get us to a point where we can be discussing with this much precision <laughs> what will hopefully be some final wording. Um, Ms. Reardon, I wondered if you could um, help me understand what sort of unreasonable costs there might be that's in that, um, that section D there. Um, or if this was just language that seemed like it might have a parallel and maybe it doesn't have uh, as much application in this, in this particular use. Absolutely. So I think it's a little of both. Um, one of the, 
one of the things we've seen is a wide variety of contracts currently proposed to residential customers. They range everywhere from a month to month, no termination fee, sign up, stay with us as long as you want, to this is a 20 year lock in. And even if you move, you have to find someone to fill your spot. So we're really seeing in the early stages of community solar that there's a wide range, um, a wide array of potential contracts that these customers might enter into. So we can't really anticipate what those charges might look like um, at the onset because you know, we're, we have 10 of these facilities online and most of those have been for maybe two months at most. So it's very early. And so our thought was we have, let's see, we deregulated in, in 2000. So 20 years of, of potential competitive electricity provider knowledge behind us. Let's pull over as much as we can, because even in the competitive electricity provider world, it's an individual contract between a customer and their provider. Um, and so if that language applied there, we thought, well, there's probably going to be a place. We may not know exactly what it is now, but there's probably going to be a place for it in this world as it evolves. Representative Grahowski, any follow-up there? Um, no, that's helpful. I did have a second question, if that's all right. Sure, go ahead. Um, <laughs> my second question was about the... Um, five days, within five days of receipt of the first bill or invoice that they could rescind the decision. I interpret that to mean that they could terminate the contract if they decided, you know, this isn't what we expected, but they would still presumably have to pay for that service that they had taken for that month. Is that accurate? So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 think, well, we hadn't really drilled down to that level of specificity. Um, I suppose that would, that would make sense that they'd still be responsible for that, for that first bill. Um, or I suppose if the committee thought it was appropriate, um, you know, they could put that risk back onto the provider. And if the customer ends up, you know, deciding to back out because it wasn't what they were promised, maybe it, maybe it does make sense that they're not even on the hook for that first bill. Um, I think at the end of the day, that's not so much a legal issue for us as it would be just sort of a, a, a policy call on your part. So if I may, the way that it reads now, it's maybe unclear and we would wanna specify one or the other if we were concerned. I think that's right. I, and I think that's a good point. We, we hadn't really fo focused on that, but I think you're absolutely right that that should be clarified. Great. And I see Deirdre's making a note of that. Excellent. Um, I, I, it sounds as if, um, Mitch, um, you, you, you feel that, that the PUC could take on um, that portion of it that we were discussing earlier. Um, and I was wondering if maybe you, you could Kind of report back to the committee if it's if it's become a problem. Um, perhaps consult with the AG on um, you know anything that you feel their expertise lends itself to. Um, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I again I think so. Uh, Again, this, this gets really down to, uh, again, my view, it's, it's, it's a contract issue. So that's not generally what we'd be getting involved in. Uh, you know, we could see if it becomes an issue, um, you know, the, dealing with the uh, marketing of project sponsors is going to be a, uh, will probably be a real drain on our resources and the resources of our consumer assistance division. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how, yeah, we can see how that goes. Um, just so the committee knows the business model that we understand is out there and there may be others is that customers would get a discount on their bill, their electricity bill then they would get bills by the project sponsor for whatever they agreed to pay, which hopefully is less than the discount they got. So when a customer gets a bill from the project sponsor, I think there's gonna be real questions about what, why am I getting a bill to, to pay the project sponsor 
not understanding that they got a discount off their uh, electricity bill as what you know is what they're what they contracted for so you know the notion that again this is a different provision that a customer gets the bill and then can unwind the contract i guess it goes to representative gorowski's point do, do they have to get back their credits that they already got so it's it's, it's I think it's going to be complicated and I think there's going to be a lot of confusion when customers start getting separate bills from sponsors, separate from their electric bill. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I see Representative Wood has her hand up. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. I have a feeling this question was already asked and answered, but if it was, it didn't sink in. So I know that Ms. Reardon, you spoke about um, things were sort of, it sounded like set up similar to the competitive electricity providers when that was new. And, and I just wonder in that situation, if there's unfair and deceptive business practices, who's responsible for that? Is that the PUC or is that the AG's office? Ms. Reardon. Oh, that is an excellent question and one that I think that uh, Chris Taub or Mitch uh, Tannenbaum could speak to better regarding how that's flushed out in the statute. I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but um, I just, my parallel was, you know, this is an emerging market, so we should use lessons learned in a similar market to mm -hmm. to beef up the statute while we have the opportunity. But um, regarding to unfair trade practices, I'm going to defer to the other experts mm -hmm. on that one. Chris, do you want to take a stab at that? Yes, yeah, so if, if I understand the question, um, which is who would sort of be responsible for enforcing violations of the Unfair Trade Practices Act, under this, under this version, it would be the AG's office, as I understand it. Um, so that, that would mean that if there's any, if there's any violation of, of any of the specified paragraphs, or even if, well, so let me step back for a second. It is, it is conceivable that, that, that a, a company could violate the Unfair Trade Practices Act even without violating one of those specific provisions A through I. And, and so that's why there is sort of that, that catch-all paragraph that talks about the Unfair Trade Practices Act. Um, so I think in terms of, 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 the, of the allocation of responsibility, um, I think any of the specified paragraphs that fall within the jurisdiction or just a general complaint uh, about a violation of the Unfair Trade Practices Act would fall within the AG's jurisdiction. Um, did I answer your question, Representative Wood? I'm not, I'm not sure if I did or not. <laughs> I, well, who knows what my question really is. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand if for the competitive electricity providers and, and there's a, it sounds like a contract in that case, and that was created a long time ago, who's responsible for enforcement of well, that? I don't, that I don't know the answer to. I haven't, to, to be honest, I have not looked, looked at that statute. Um, I, think I, I will say generally the AG's office handles unfair trade practices. So I, I would suspect that would be within our, within our purview. So why would this be different than that? This would be a good time to go to, let me start with uh, Deirdre and then Mitch. Yeah, I'm sure Mitch can give you better detail, but I can specify that the statute currently is set up that those are under the provisions of PUC for CEPs, but it does have the similar language that says that the PUC or the AG can take an action to superior court. So that first paragraph of the enforcement language, I think, is in the CEP statute. And I do think some of the differences here between the CEP statute and the project sponsors is the, CEP, the PUC does license CEP, so they have a different relationship Mm -hmm. I think with that entity, then a project sponsor isn't licensed, but I'll, let, I'll defer to the PUC on the specifics and if they've been taking Unfair Trade Practices Act cases themselves. Yeah, um, so historically, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the issues we've had with CEPs have been marketing issues, um, deceptive marketing, <laughs> and we have dealt with those issues, and we have had enforcement proceedings. We have uh, imposed penalties on providers 
for violating our rules regarding, you know, how you market to customers and, and uh, you know, providing false information. So that is something we have done. That has been the major issue with CEPs uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also caution the committee that this isn't so much drawing a bright line, and I hope Chris agrees, between us and the AG's office. Um, it might just be more primary jurisdiction, so to speak. Uh, for example, now with the marketing of uh, solar credits, we have been working with the uh, AG's office. When we get complaints, we keep them involved. And, uh, you know, there may be a point where it would be more appropriate for the AG's office to work on some kind of mediation or something like that, depending on how the facts play out. But I don't see this as drawing such a fine line. And again, I hope Chris agrees with that. But uh, yeah, our our focus on CEP and the issue has been marketing. Um, really, we haven't gotten into the contracts themselves. We haven't gotten complaints on those. Uh, unfair trade practices is not within our wheelhouse. So, you know, if we think something's going on, we refer that to the AG's office. But within the unfair trade practices, I assume going and knocking on somebody's door and telling them that you're with CMP and will lower your bill when they're not is an unfair trade practices act mm -hmm. uh, a violation. I assume so. Uh, but we would we would take that. The, that's the one we would have primary um, jurisdiction, so to speak, um, on that kind of thing. But other types of unfair trade practices that are outside that realm, we would have no expertise with and we would refer to the AG's office. Thank Great. you. Representative Wood, any other no. follow up from you? Okay, super. Um, so what I'm hearing, Mr. Tannenbaum, is that, is that if we were to assign you this primary responsibility for now, um, understanding we can always change the law, um, that you will um, continue to work with the AG's office uh, and you know figure it out in this brave new world. Is that fair? Yes, Representative, that's fair. I, th I think we could okay. we could work it out. And, and as you suggested, if there's a problem, we'll come back. We'll let you know. <laughs> You'll be the first to know. I don't doubt it. That's great. Okay. Um, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe this question is for Ms. Ridd. Uh, you mentioned, I believe, that there are 10 concerns now that are currently in this market uh, soliciting customers. And I believe the relatively, uh, the, it's been a relatively short time since customers have actually been participating and, and being billed, if you will. Uh, how many instances have there been? Have, have occurred thus far that this legislation would have been, uh, would have come into play had it been available. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster. I think um, just to clarify, there are 10 solar facilities currently online under this model in Central Maine Power Territory. Um, I haven't checked with Versant Power to know if, if it's the same 10 or if they have a different, different number um, at this time, but the Consumer protections that we're looking to put in place, many of them evolve from the calls that I received and the initial contracts those customers were being offered. As I mentioned earlier, the the potential 20-year lock-in for a residential customer. You know, we we've limited competitive electricity providers to, I believe, 18 months or no longer than the current contract, right? 18 months versus 20 years with no out. Um, if you move, you were responsible to find somebody to, to fulfill that. That was that was a big concern when we heard that these sorts of offers were being made to residential customers. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there would be a rulemaking in place that put um, some more protections around what these contracts were able to provide to residential and small business customers and, and what that framework would look like if they, if they needed recourse, um, because it, it was a little unclear to us in looking at the current statute. So, so I can't say that there are many situations that this legislation would have, would have prevented unless we get to a point where there's a rulemaking that puts contract term limits in place. Um, 
I think, like Mr. Tannenbaum said, a lot of what we see in competitive electricity providers is marketing, but also contract renewals. I think that the Consumer Assistance Division gets a lot of calls when their rates go up. Um, and I get a lot of calls and people say, I'm paying a lot more. So I think where I'm expecting to get calls is when contracts end and are re-upped. What does that model look like? And the net energy and billing model has a lot more consumer protections built in from the way that customers are billed and paid um, and pay for the services. So I, I'm not worried about the exact same issues, but that's when I expect to see issues arise is when current contracts end what happens to the consumers at that point. That's usually when I get calls on the competitive electricity provider market. So it's when I would expect to get calls on the community solar side as well. Uh, thank you for that clear, concise answer. Great. So it seems that we have an amendment and that there's some um, agreement now on um, who can do what, which is great. Um, there is one other uh, wrinkle, and this is an issue that I brought up in presenting the bill. Um, the bill is, is the public advocate's bill, but I did throw in a little twist of my own. And it, it, it's an issue that came up this morning um, in our briefing uh, from the PUC. And this relates to um, the ability that um, the, these community solar uh, providers currently have to market the product as, as green or renewable or solar or clean energy, but then to turn around and sell the RECs uh, to someone in Massachusetts, for example, um, which means that really what you're getting is not clean or renewable or solar or, or, or green. So um, I just wanna flag that issue and see if the, you know, I, I personally think it's the problem that needs to be solved. Um, I, I, I don't believe that you, we should allow for that kind of double counting or double dipping. Um, I, I think it's frankly, I think it's deceptive marketing. Um, you know, if, if, if I develop a solar farm, I, I own the solar farm and I sign up subscribers um, and tell them it's, so, it's green and then turn around and sell the recs uh, in, in, you know, in another state, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, double dipping. And I, I, I think it's, I think it, it, I'm also marketing deceptively. So I want to ask if we could, as a committee, uh, agree to further amend this bill to define that sort of behavior as deceptive marketing. Um, I think we all value the integrity of, of these offerings and we want to make sure that, um, you know, if, if it's, if it's renewable, it gets counted once and only once. Um, so let me, let me just you know, ask, I'll start with uh, the public advocate, since it's your bill, would you have any objection to our um, defining uh, that as deceptive marketing, uh, effectively requiring that the RECs be retired um, if it's going to be marketed as solar or green or renewable or whatever? Representative Perry, that's an excellent question. That issue did not come up until it was raised by you, and I thank you for raising it. Uh, it's based upon what I know, um, I welcome the discussion. I have, we have not taken a position on it, but I would welcome the discussion. And because that's something that I, I commend you for, Representative Barry, coming up with that issue, just as um, Ms. Reardon came up with the 20 year issue, which still is out there. What we attempted to do is is to get on get ahead of the curve, get ahead of this this onslaught um, of in you know companies that are out there marketing their wear. So uh, it's something we could a couple possibilities. We could uh, <clears throat> have another workshop on it, um, figure out what the answer is. I I'm not familiar as much as probably you are with. With the rec issue, I obviously I have a working knowledge of it, but I don't have, I can't tell you what that effect. Just as I can't tell you what the 20 year contract would be, it seems to me as a matter of public policy, uh, that is a long period of time. Um, but that's the selling point uh, with long term contracts because they're, bun they're bundling together all these individual contracts into a bundle uh, with a 20 year span, I believe. So that's another issue for for another day, but it's important though we get something on the books. 
in in Agreed. order. Is what what it is if we can get at least the jurisdictional issues on the books, as we have with competitive energy providers, we can have that start. Have the committee, if you wanted to, um, maybe look at the issues and then come back with a further discussion of those issues uh, during this next special session, or I guess if whatever the sessions, whatever you call it these days. Um, so that might be an idea is to is to get something on the books because I don't know if you've been getting telemarketing calls, but they're out there. And there's as as Kara said, there's about 10 or 12 companies that are out, you know, and it's going to become a problem sometime if we don't do something. And so I, I'm glad the attorney general's office and Chris, you're involved in this because those are further discussions and um that's basically where we are. Carrie, you have anything to add? Ms. Reardon? I did yeah, see your course. hand earlier. Right as I right as I was taking a drink. I, I think I echo um, Mr. Hobbins' point that if we can get these consumer protections on the book and then really evolve into the, the rec market, I think that might be, mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, a, a more preferable path. I've only received one phone call where individual actually understood Rex and was curious if if this subscription um, included the Rex purchase or not and, and understood it at that level. Most of the the folks I'm uh, that I speak with on a daily basis have no idea that that's a whole separate market and that there's there's potentially deceptive marketing there. You know that would be an hour long conversation at best on my end. I would also just as a question for the committee because it's um, I'm not an attorney and so I don't pretend to understand how most of this works, but. We have competitive electricity providers offering green products that come from renewable resources, and I don't believe we'd ask them to disclose whether the RECs are included in that purchase or not. So I feel like this might be a more complicated conversation than adding it into this consumer protection bill, just as, a, as, some, as food for thought. You know, like I said, maybe it's already covered. I don't know. Um, that's that's great. Thank you, Ms. Reardon. And, and we can certainly take this up in a separate um, in a separate vehicle. Uh, but but let me go next to um, uh, Senator Lawrence, we can come back to uh, um, Mitch, I see your hand as well, um, and, Rep and Representative Grahowski also. Senator Lawrence. Sorry, I'm getting attacked by Skeet here, so I apologize. Um, so I was going to suggest that, yeah, very much Representative Barry, you do what um, has been talked about. We pass what we've got because that discussion you raised is a much more intricate discussion and it's gonna have a lot of different legal aspects that really need to be thoroughly um, thought through and I'd hate to slow down this bill uh, for those discussions. Thank you, Senator, that's great. And uh, uh, Representative Krahowski. Thank you. Um, I'm not certain that it needs to be, this conversation needs to be in this bill, but I would like to hear what other vehicle we might use because I think to Ms. Reardon's point, people don't even know to ask. It's the number one thing I ask um, my constituents when they say, I wanna buy solar power, should I go with this 20 year agreement? Should I do this month by month? And I said, you need to ask, where are the recs? Because if you don't have the recs, you don't have anything, but you're a bank essentially, you're financing a project, which has value, but it has a different value. And so um, I think it is, it would be, and I don't know if people are marketing in such a way that a person is deceived about that, uh, but if they don't even know to ask and we don't have anything that would encourage our um, providers of these agreements, these arrangements to do the right thing on the books, then they have really no reason to not do the right thing other than they're good people and I hope they are, but um, I think sometimes putting things in statute can keep people staying within the lines and that would be good for the consumer. It's just, it's the number one question people should have that they don't even know they need to have when they think about making this decision. Uh, regarding 20 years, I do understand that because if somebody is really financing a project, um, the solar developer needs to know that they have that money coming in for the period of time that they 
expect. Otherwise they've suddenly got a project with nobody paying for it anymore. <laughs> so I do think I understand that and I'm not as concerned by it. I don't know if Skeet's opinion on the matter, but <laughs> um, I apologize. I, you just no, it, it's great. I, um, so I, I think it's not as uh, troubling to me as it might seem. Um, I would make a 20 year investment to put solar on my roof, but it doesn't make sense for me to put on my roof. But if I'm going to really commit to that, I would be willing to commit to it anywhere in the landscape, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Representative Grahowski. And um, I, I, I'm going to ask uh, Deirdre in a moment if we have any other bills that could be um, uh, amended. I know I have a couple that are solar related and I'd be happy to put out a sponsor's amendment that allows people to have a, he a hearing on this issue. Um, I share Representative Grahowski's concern um, and I don't think, I think it's complex but not overly complex. Um, we do uh, regulate deceptive marketing elsewhere. Mr. Tannenbaum, you had a, a your hand up earlier. Yeah, I, I just want to say on behalf of the commission that um, we agree, Representative Berry, that the recs are not retired and sold somewhere else, whether it's another state or even in Maine, then you're not getting green power. Uh, as far as a CEP, if the CEP is marketing, which some do, 100% green power, we require them to purchase recs to cover the load, the customer's load, and retire those racks. Otherwise, it's deceptive. Um, another approach might be as a condition of participating in net energy billing, you are required to, to retire your racks. A little bit different approach than deceptive practices, because that would get into somebody that explains it. And then we got to say, well, did you explain it clearly or not? You might want to just say, if you participate in the NEB promotional program, and you're getting that benefit, you have to retire the racks. Otherwise, it's not green. Hope, hopefully, that's helpful. That is helpful. And I might even be inclined to do both of those things. But um, Ms. Schneider, do we have um, bills that, that can still be um, amended in a timely fashion? Do we have a vehicle that would be appropriate? I would have to look at the list of all the bills, but I'm assuming you have a lot of bills that touch on NEB or already doing alterations within the statutory provisions that you could probably utilize that to, um, to make an amendment on and we could put it out before the hearing to say this is going to be an additional factor that would be considered in this bill. I would also point out too that the um, current amendment before you does allow the PUC some discretionary ability to adopt other applicable standards or requirements that they think that may be necessary and that's broad through the rulemaking process so um, they if they are kind of favorable in the idea that not something needs to be addressed by Rex they do have the ability to do that without it being you know obviously if the commit if the legislature wants something very specific, you want to put that in statute, but there is flexibility within the current amendment before you to do something on this within within that paragraph. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, okay, so not seeing any other hands, um, you know, I, I think um, it's important that we give that uh, additional matter a, a little more oxygen before we make a decision on it. Um, you know, I'd like everyone to feel comfortable, feel that they fully understand the issue of double counting and RECs um, before we take an affirmative action. So, so what we have is, is uh, LD 507 as, as uh, Deirdre has outlined it. Um, the one minor change suggested by Representative Grahowski would be included in any possible amendment. And I think that's where things stand. Um, so this might be a good time uh, to entertain a motion if there is one in the offing. And if no one is ready to vote on this, then we can just leave it on the table. <laughs> Representative Grasky. Um, I move uh, that we accept this amendment with the addition of clarifying that if 
um, a customer has received a bill and is going to terminate their contract, that they are still required to pay for the period of time in which they took the service. Great. Okay. So that's the ought to pass as amended motion from Representative Grahowski. Is there a second? Representative uh, Ziegler, I saw your hand flash. Representative Cuddy, thirds the motion. And uh, is there any discussion? Representative Grahowski, I see your hand up, but I don't think you're looking to discuss the bill mm -hmm. at this time. Any discussion at all? In that case, we'll proceed to a vote and I will ask uh, Jordan to call the roll for the first time. And um, hopefully Izzy has explained to you how that's done, but uh, if not, we can walk you through it. Great. Um, we'll start with Senator Lawrence, who I think stepped out with his dog potentially so maybe we can yes circle we'll back him there. As absent. okay uh senator vitelli yes senator vitelli is a yes uh senator stewart also okay. absent absent um excuse me representative barry yes representative barry is a yes representative cuddy yes Representative Cuddy is a yes. Rep Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Uh, let's see. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth. Yay. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Um, Representative Grignan, I believe, is absent as well. Yep. Um, let's see. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. And then Representative Carlo? Aye. Representative Carlo is a an aye. Um, so those voting in favor, we have, we have 11 with three absent, I believe. Okay, so the motion prevails and it is unanimous. Um, and, that count uh, can't be accurate, though. Hold on. Ten. Oh, that's true. Ten in favor with three <laughs> absent. My apologies. I'll learn how to count as we go on, apparently. <laughs> Excellent. It does take time. Yeah. Very good, especially with legislators. We're, we're squirrely <laughs> sometimes. We move around in our seats. Okay, so that brings us to um, LD82, and I think we want to just... Um, take this up uh, as an update, um, uh, perhaps not a work session um, per se, but um, Representative Kessler, the sponsor of the bill, I believe has uh, uh, an update for us and I'll turn it over to you, Representative Kessler. And if you wanna have Ms. Schneider walk us through anything, um, I'm sure she's ready to do that. Thank you. Um, I had sent uh, or, uh, Teardra had sent out um, a um, draft of the letter uh, on behalf of the committee to uh, the chief executive. And um, uh, it essentially lays out uh, the intention of LD82 in the form of a letter. Um, and ho hopefully you all have uh, read through it at this point. Uh, and if not, we can have Deirdre go through it but um, there, there may be one or more who have something to say about the contents of the letter, so. Okay, Ms. Schneider, are you willing to walk us through that letter? And it was sent out, or just put it in front of us, perhaps. Sure, I, I don't have that up, so I was gonna take a second to oh, find yeah. it. Okay, no problem. Well, let me ask the committee, has everyone, is there anyone who has not seen the letter that would that would find it helpful if it were shared with us here. Okay, in that case, we may not need it. Do okay. It well? All right, I just got it. But if you need me All to right. pull it up, I will. It basically, the letter is just sort of explaining 
that the committee has the resolve before them, a general overview of what the resolve does, and then sort of just reiterating the importance of participation in these discussions and, and the hopes that the governor would use whatever means that she has at her disposal to sort of be able to participate in these discussions. It gives an example of a, an opportunity where the, we potentially missed out on having a, a voice at the table and then requesting um, that you know, she would inform the committee of any discussions or developments related to the project and that the hope would be that the committee could resolve this through this more informal channel than, than passing legislation. So that's very broadly what the letter does. Great, any discussion? I think Representative Kessler is looking to um, uh, earn, earn our support for this letter and ask each of us to, to, to sign on. Um, so now is a good time to discuss if you have any concerns or questions for him. Uh, Representative Kessler, your hand is up, so go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to uh, also mention that in the letter, it, it uh, makes specific the body in which they reach out to, which, which is um, the committee which has been engaged in the infrastructure planning, so. Great. Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Kessler, for um, working on drafting this with Deirdre. Thank you. Um, I made a very small comment to Deirdre, which is not really substantive, um, just suggesting we say this resolve would require rather than saying it does require since it's not official. But separately, I think that's pretty minor. Um, I felt uncomfortable um, with the sentence that read, we believe this project could provide economic environmental benefits to electric ratepayers, including the potential to be a path for export of Maine produced renewable energy to Canada. Um, I, I communicated with Representative Kessler that I personally would be more comfortable with something um, a little more uh, general, such as we believe this project could have economic and environmental implications for Maine. Um, I don't understand enough personally to say that I think there are definite benefits. I do feel confident that if there was a proposal to build a transmission line through any portion of Maine, that there would certainly be implications that we would care about. But I, I didn't want to go so far as to say that there are benefits that, that I expect. Um, so I, I put that out there as a friendly amendment or language change to the letter if others are interested in that. Great. I'll go next to Rep. Uh, Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Grohoski, uh, for that uh, friendly amendment. Uh, with, that in, with that change included, I think this is otherwise a very well-crafted letter. And I think it expresses what I remember hearing of the discussion among this group, and I would support sending this letter. Great. And um, Representative Kessler. Yeah, I just also wanted to express that I, I am um, supportive of Representative Grahowski's edit to the letter. Okay, so uh, I think what we'll do, just so um, Deirdre has some clarity as to um, how to craft the letter, um, and it could be from the entire committee or could, if necessary, be specific names from the committee. Um, is just take a, a straw vote right now. Uh, we don't need to call the roll, but um, just to know that people are, um, you know, um, interested in in uh, being being on this letter, um, potentially as a whole committee. We, we shall see. So, uh, Senator Lawrence, before I go to a straw vote, your is your name up? Are you is your hand up to to vote or to speak? To vote. I can read your lips. Okay. Um, all right, so all those in, interested in, in uh, putting their name on this letter, please indicate with a show of hands. Senator Lawrence was showing us the way. Okay. And it is unanimous. Okay. So that makes it easier for Deirdre. Um, but uh, Deirdre, I, I assume you'll be checking in with others who aren't with us at this time. Yeah, I can definitely, once I finalize the change, just resend it to the committee. And if anybody has any other concerns or questions, they can let me know and I can forward those on. 
Excellent, thank you. And Representative Foster? Yes, Mr. Chair, I just would like to clear, qualify my tentative vote for that um, could be based on how the suggestion from Representative Grohowski was worded. I think that is a, an important point. Thank you. Got it. Okay. And Deirdre, did you feel you captured uh, what she had to say there? I'm sure you did. You're muted. I emailed it to Deirdre oh, already. Excellent. It's in writing. That makes it easy. Okay. Uh, that will bring us to our next bill, um, which is LD-285. Um, and ag again, this will just be really an update, not a work session per se. Um, we have had some conversations. I'm going to ask um, Deirdre to um, walk us through that, uh, just kind of bring the committee up to speed. And um, as the sponsor, I'm asking for a little more time from the committee to work on this. And I'm also going to send it back to, to send the, the gavel back to Senator Lawrence if he's willing. It's it's really up to Skeet whether or not I'm willing, but okay. right now I've got him chasing things outside. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, when when he decides he wants me to resume my duties, I'm happy to okay. obey. Okay. I will obey. All right. <laughs> All right, so Seth, why don't you oh, fill us in on 285 on where it's at? Great. Okay, and I'm going to ask for help from our analysts in doing that. Sure. So um, on Monday of this week, Representative Barry, uh, Representative Wadsworth, and um, representatives from the PUC met to discuss some of the points that um, we had discussed at the last work session. So if you remember at the last work session, it was sort of left with the idea of replacing the bill with either a resolve or a letter directing the PUC to come back with some more information for the committee. Um, and some questions were raised in that discussion. And I know Representative Barry had subsequent to, uh, meeting with the COUs about one part of this this week. Um, we've also requested information from MEMA and have gotten some information from them. And so I think the game plan is now, as of now, was to still meet tomorrow to maybe refine those four points that were outlined at the last work session um, to figure out the best process forward or what kind of information the committee would be asking for. And then also trying to decide if you know a letter or a resolve would be the more appropriate vehicle for this. Is that correct, Representative Barry? That is exactly right. Couldn't have said it better myself. Good. So um, then probably procedurally what we will do is not take up this bill, simply leave it uh, on the table in work session. What does that leave us for bills to work, Deirdre? You have 508 still and uh, 487. Okay, is um, Barry Hobbins still on or? Yes. He, yeah, he's an attendee still. And I believe the PUC. Yes, still they're still on. here. Yep. Okay, so why don't we get them um, address 487? Uh, um, so I thought we were going to do 508 first because Dan is doing 487. I don't know. If okay, I lied. We're doing 508 first. So why don't you uh, why don't you update us, uh, Deirdre, on where we are on that bill? Okay, so um, if we did have a work session on this bill already. Um, if you remember, at the work session um, shortly before you met, we received a proposed amendment from NRG and Constellation, um, and the committee sort of directed me to sort of take that amendment. Well, we had a meeting subsequent to that with PUC and OPA and to decide if they felt they were comfortable with the direction that this amendment was going in and they had expressed that they were comfortable with that direction. Um, so I redrafted the amendment provided by NRG and Constellation. I have sent that amendment to all of those parties and my understanding if anybody has anything different as of now is everybody was fine with those changes. And so what it essentially does that's different than the bill proposal is the bill was structured in a way that there were the requirements of the CEP and there was a separate section regarding third party um, sales agents. And the bill sort of puts more of the responsibility on the CEP to report information and to make sure that the third party sales agents are acting accordingly. Um, and it does add a little bit, it does give the PC some ability to go 
to deal with the third party sales agents directly because it, it requires they be registered in the PUC gives a registration number to those third party sales agents. It gives them some ability within sort of their penalty provisions to you know, put penalties directly on the third party sales agent and revoke their licenses issued by the um, commission. And it provides some definitions. So a new part that wasn't in the bill was a definition for door to door sales to make it clear that we're talking about sort of a person who's going towards residential and non and small non and small commercial customers in a door-to-door -door sales way to sell them um, sort of this retail electricity. Um, and so those that was making it clear what the universe was and that it wasn't applying more broadly to people who may email or brokers or things of that nature. Um, so yeah, the base Basically, it just removes that whole provision of the original bill that dealt ex exclusively third party sales agents and puts a lot of those pieces in under the CEP's requirements currently. Okay, any questions for Deirdre about what this amendment does? Deirdre, remind me procedurally, did we have an ought to pass as amended on the floor? No, I think you had left it that the uh, amendment that you had received at the work session was a little confusing to sort through at the time. And so you just directed me to work on it further and table okay. it. Do we have a motion now ought to pass as amended? Representative Barry. I'd like to move the bill ought to pass as amended. The amendment being uh, what uh, Deirdre has outlined. Okay. And uh, obviously we would have to review that when it came back if we voted on this. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Representative Wadsworth. Any debate or discussion? Representative Grohowski. Because I value consistency, um, Mr. Chair, the only thing I would point out that we might want to discuss is I think the goal with the previous legislation we just acted on um, was to have sort of parallels between how we protect consumers here and how we protect them with community solar. And we made that change to say that the consumer can rescind um, their participation or their contract with community solar within five days of receiving their first bill. This is this here says five days of initial selection. So I just wanted to flag that for the committee in case we do have an interest in changing that in a similar way as the way that I propose we amend the last one. Um, we don't have to, I just wanted to bring that up as a point where, as was pointed out by, I believe it was the attorney general's office, sometimes people don't realize that they're not happy with what they got till they actually get the bill, not just they wake up in five days and say, oh, wow, I think that might've been a bad idea <laughs> randomly, as opposed to seeing in their hands that they made a mistake. So I put that out there, not as an amendment, but as a possible item to discuss. So let me ask the uh, movement, is he willing to do a friendly amendment to that effect? That is a very friendly amendment. And uh, Representative Wadsworth, as the seconder, are you comfortable with that? Good. Any other debate or discussion? Jordan, this is going to be your first roll call vote with this committee, I believe. Are you ready? I am. I am. Okay, Actually, there was see. one taken when when you were out, Senator Lawrence. So darn. I was yeah. able to I was able to get an absent in, so you know I have a little bit of practice. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, why don't you then, being as experienced as you are, <laughs> go ahead and call the roll. All right. Uh, so, Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. I believe Senator Stewart is still absent. Is that I believe. So, Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth. Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Uh, Representative Grignan is currently absent. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. And Representative Carlo? Aye. Representative Carlo is a yes. Um, so the bill is unanimous with 
This time, 11 yeses and two absences. Great. That's two done. Okay, are we ready, uh, Dan, to go on to your bill, 487? I'm ready if you are. We are wicked ready. So why don't you tell us where we are at on this bill? Um, so you, at the last um, work session, you heard from both uh, the Office of Public Advocate and the Public Utilities Commission regarding their respective positions on the matter. Um, there was no resolution at that time. And since that time, um, I understand they have had some discussions. You received this morning um, a proposal from uh, the PUC that they had submitted to the OPA and had not heard back on. And then um, sometime later you received the OPA's response. Um, I, I, I don't wanna speak for either entity, but I understand there may have been further discussions since that time. Okay, why don't we hear, hear from the two entities on where they're at on this? And we'll start off with the public advocate and then we'll go to the PUC. Can you Jordan add Barry and um, they both Phil back on? Barry, why don't you tell us where we're at on this, where you, the public advocate is at on this bill? Sure, we're having a, We've had some discussion, uh, both in writing and um, in personal discussions over the past week or so. Um, I'm pleased that the office and the staff of the Public Utilities Commission um, has made some suggestions which are favorable. Um, we have we have a proposed modification of the prior proposal by the PUC, and um, we really have not had an opportunity uh, to discuss that and re didn't receive any, any uh, input back. I agree that this is a, an issue that uh, has come a long way from the original bill, and I would hope that uh, I see the chairman is here and I think of some more discussions might lead to a resolution. And I'll just ask uh, uh, Chairman Bartlett if you think more discussion may be fruitful or do we need to go ahead and decide this issue? Well, I think we might be, I think there's just one tiny issue that might need to be worked out that I think we could, you could do today. Um, I think we had proposed originally at the last uh, work session uh, that filing fees be used as a way to fund the experts. And we continue, I think there's agreement around that between the two offices. And then I sent a second proposal, or we sent a second proposal, which was authorized the OPA to take in funds into a segregated account that would be used for, um, uh, that'd be approved, as, if it was approved as part of settlements, was consistent with public policy and other statutory requirements, um, would allow the public advocate to take in money to be used for, uh, things like um, public uh, uh, education campaigns and the like. And uh, just also noting as a limitation that any in a case that involved penalty funds, only amounts above the statutory penalty amount could be allocated to such a fund because there's already a statute in place that deals with the penalty provisions. Um, the Public Advocates Office sent two changes to what we sent. The first one, I'm not sure I fully understand and maybe we can... Uh, it may not be an issue at all, or maybe a minor revision would get us there. And the second one uh, was just, I had a series of um, four considerations um, that uh, the public advocate has taken a couple of them and replaced it with a third option, which I think is perfectly acceptable to us. So there's only one provision um, that had to do with, I think we had indicated that um, we could approve it consistent with these particular uh, considerations. And I think the public advocates version asks, uh, says that we must approve it in those circumstances. And I'm not entirely sure what's intended because any approval would be part of a global settlement um, that would be considered in total. So I, I'm just under, unclear what that means, but I suspect we can get there. 
Barry? Well, I think that uh, due respect to the um, PUC and chairman, um, we felt more comfortable after, after we've come a long way, but we felt more comfortable with the language we proposed. Um, I wish we could maybe negotiate a little more. I really am not in a position uh, to, to fold my hand right now, uh, but I do respect this, the amendments that have been offered. So, so I, I, I think we're, we're almost there. I would rather have a personal discussion um, if in fact that's their final situation um, with, with the chair or with, with Mitch. And so that's basically where we are. Okay, well, it sounds like we're not at a meeting of the minds yet, but we're very, very close. So I'm gonna suggest we just leave this on the table and um, take it up at our next work session. Sure. If you guys can't work it out, just bring it back to us, tell us what the difference is and we'll vote it one way or another. Very good, fair enough. Okay. Dan, do we have anything else? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I assume Deirdre might still be on, but um, I think that was all that was on the agenda for today. Hey, Seth. Oh, yeah, just uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to that last bill, uh, I just want to, you know, encourage um, the commission and the public advocate to, um, you know, as as you work towards a resolution on that one issue, to also um, help us think about resource adequacy uh, for the. Office of the Public Advocate, I, I continue to be, and I know I've expressed this before, so I won't belabor it, but I do continue to be concerned about the um, asymmetry between uh, the, the, the two sides of the table at the PUC, the, the Public Advocate on the one hand and the utilities on the other, um, and, and, and just, just how much more um, ratepayer funded um, resources are going into arguing for rate increases rather than rate <laughs> decreases. Um, so if you could just be prepared to answer my questions about that at the next work session, that would be great. Thank you. Deirdre, do we have anything else? Dan was correct, we're, we're all done for the day. We're all done. Any committee members have anything they wanna say before we go? Did I just hear Representative Barry and Representative Foster agree upon working towards rate reductions? I think you did. <laughs> I, I'm not sure which who was on what side of the table he was talking about, though. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we'll uh, we'll adjourn for the day, and we're on on Tuesday. Uh, refresh my memory. What we have coming up on Tuesday, Deirdre? Um, quite a few public hearings. I think there's 